Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our CESA seminar. My name is Raj Narula. I am the Associate Postgraduate Dean for SAS Doctors in Wales, and I'm also the Chair of Associate Deans UK. We have a very tight sh schedule, so we need to start in time, and members from the GMC Specialist Registration Team have also joined in. They are Peter Clegg, who's the Specialist Application Team Coordinator, along with Josephine Broadhurst, Alicia Lafferty, and Sarah McDermott. Tom will be leading in the surgical breakout room, Josie in the medical, medicine and psychiatry, and Alicia in the a &E and anesthetic room. So by the end of the workshop, we will have a clear overview of the CESAR process and advice how to prepare a good quality application. We have about 100 applicants or delegates registered to be precise 108. And for sometimes it can be difficult really for people to join in. And so we are helping those people who are having difficulty joining in. In your pack, there are three bundles of information that has been provided to you all relating to the CESAR process, which you'll find it very useful. And I will encourage everyone to read this for those who might not have had a chance to do so. Also, I think the joining instructions have been provided to you. So few words of housekeeping. And don't worry, I'm not going to be telling you about where the toilet facilities or the fire exit, those are. It is just to make sure that anyone who wants to put a question, they can put it in the chat bar and every effort will be made to answer them today or later because, because of time constraints. Please don't raise the hand up as difficult to trace the sequence of raised hands. At the end of the session, there will be a link to log in to give your feedback, and only once you've done it, your CPD certificate can be sent to you. So without further uh, say, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Ian Collins. Ian Collins is a consultant psychiatrist and also head of the School of Psychiatry. He qualified from the Imperial College London of Medicine, but did his training in Wales, and he liked it so much that he stayed here and welcome Ian. He's also the program director for Swansea Training Scheme. And he's now the director of Medic Pro Professional Support and Development at EIW. So welcome all over to you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Hopefully um, you can hear me okay. Yes. Um, and thank you for um, inviting me to, um, I guess, give one of the opening addresses to this um, a Caesar seminar um, this morning. I, I just want to um, thank you, Raj and Carolyn and uh, Fiona and colleagues from HEIW for um, organizing this, um, and also colleagues from the GMC um, as well for um, working with us to organize this conference. Really, I just wanted to um, talk to you this morning for about five minutes um, about some of the things we're doing um, to um, help to support and develop our SAS doctors um, and our locally employed doctors um, across Wales. Um, I was appointed about a year ago now as the Director of Medic Professional Support and Development within um, the Medical Deanery of HEIW. And one of my um, roles is really working with um, Raj in the wider SAS team, so the network of um, tutors across all the health boards to try and improve um, the offer really in terms of developing and supporting um, SAS doctors. Now, as part of our uh, strategic plan for 2021-2022, um, we had an objective um, that we had to, to deliver for SAS doctors, and that was about levelling up, if you like. It was about making uh, ensuring that SAS doctors across Wales had equitable access to
to education and training. I think ultimately the vision for us um, in HEIW is to make the SAS route um, just as an attractive career route um, than sort of the traditional um, training pathways route. So we're actually committed um, to, to, to delivering um, a range of education and support opportunities for SAS doctors. And in terms of what we've done so far um, in, in 2021, 2022, um, some of you, um, thank you, by the way, some of you would have completed a survey um, that was sent out earlier this year. Uh, and that survey really was primarily to explore your views as an SAS body as to what your development and training needs um, would be. I think we had something like, um, you know, 200 and odd um, responses, 252 responses to that survey. So um, I want to thank you. And it gave us some really useful um, and interesting results in terms of sort of your appetite and what you would like from us uh, to ensure that um, we're sort of supporting and developing you. The next big advance uh, that we've done in, in, in this year is developing the um, HIW Caesar advice line. Um, some of you may have seen it advertised or heard about it, but we wanted really to give you uh, an email address that you could contact us on if you were thinking of um, embarking upon the Caesar route, because also aligned to that is our SAS Caesar network. And we've been very fortunate to have a number of doctors across Wales, across multiple specialties, who've agreed to work with us and to offer sort of informal support and advice um, to doctors who are thinking of embarking upon um, the Caesar route. These are doctors who have already successfully negotiated um, the Caesar route. And we have a network of roughly about uh, 30 odd doctors right across Wales in various different specialties who are willing to support and offer advice for those doctors who are just embarking upon the Caesar route. So that was the next sort of big piece of work that we were involved with um, this year. In addition to that, we've also started working with some of our specialty schools, uh, the traditional specialty training schools across Wales, um, to encourage them to start opening up um, learning and training opportunities to SAS colleagues as well. As you know, uh, with the pandemic, a lot of our learning and training opportunities now are delivered online. So theoretically, there really isn't any capacity issues with regards to uh, numbers of people that can attend those training opportunities. So we're continuing to work with some of the specialty schools to open up um, what would traditionally be targeted just at trainees to SAS doctors as well. And I know some of the specialty schools such as anesthetics have started opening up those um, training opportunities and we continue to work with those specialty schools in the future to open up more training opportunities. What about the future? Well, uh, hopefully this is part of the future. Uh, you know, we're running this joint Caesar seminar today with the GMC. We're hoping to run more of these um, Caesar seminars as well. We're continuing to work with the specialty schools to open up those training opportunities further um, to um, SAS doctors. We want to evaluate um, some of the work we've done this year in terms of trying to start that work of leveling up and making training opportunities equitable um, to SAS doctors. We're looking at our SAS tutor role um, across Wales um, and how we can further add value to that role to support you um, in every corner um, of Wales. And we're also looking to develop uh, a further suite of um, educational resources, if you like, almost a generic curriculum of teaching and training on um, leadership, on teaching, on quality improvement. And we're looking to develop that uh, throughout 2020-2022 uh, to, to give to you, to help you to develop in those, some of those generic areas which are so important um, for your CESA um, application. So I'm cognizant of the time. I think my time's up. Uh, I wanted to thank you uh, again for the opportunity to speak. And I want to wish you a really great morning um, at the SAS CESA seminar. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Thanks very much.
So next is I'm going to give you a small presentation on top tips for applying for Caesar. So give me a minute while I download my presentation. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can see that, Raj. Okay, thanks. So from my personal experience, you know, I was probably one of the first few who got Caesar in Wales. So I'm just give, going to give you some tips. You know, some of this will be covered, you know, as we go along in other presentations, but just a few important tips, you know, when you apply for Caesar for all delegates who are intending to do so. So my first and foremost thing is don't rush into applying for Caesar unless all your information is complete. If you are missing some, some process which you haven't got your, your thing, don't apply for it, delay your application because you have to get your portfolio right before you start rushing into it. Secondly, make sure that you ensure that you apply through the right route for applying for Caesar. There are two pathways to Caesar, one in a recognized specialty in this country and one in a specialty which is not recognized in country. So make sure you go through the right route. Include your full and current CV and make sure you put your CV in a methodical way or in order wise from dates which matches your application. Previously, documentary-based evidence to assess was usually based about 800 to 100, 1,000 page, pages were required. Evidence had to be validate, validated and authenticated and anonymous, but validation of evidence is no longer applied as this has changed to the current verification, electronic evidence is largely accepted. And I've given you a link to this GMC website where you can find out a bit more about this. Make sure you translate your documents into English because some of your qualifications, which you might have done abroad, may be in a different language and you would want to translate that. Remember, your application is assessed against the standard of the CCT curriculum. So make sure that you know exactly what the CCT curriculum is. Choose your referees carefully. Only four referees are asked for with a maximum of six. Get your consent from the referees. Go and speak to them. Tell them what exactly the application process is and what is required from them. The college will use structured reports to triangulate your evidence from your application. So make sure you get it right. And the training experience you have undertaken with them is all included. General surgery curriculum has been updated and some specialities are due to review the curriculum place at the time. So when you do this, make sure at the time of your application, you have got the latest curriculum. Previously, it used to be based on the four domains of good me medical practice. In surgical specialities, they moved away from these four dom domains. And so make sure that you know, 
you know that exactly you know what you're going to be putting in your so six things to consider when applying for application be familiar with the cct curriculum and assessment system read the detailed guidance and online application forms on the gmc website specialty specific guidance for each ccc specialty and type of evidence required to support your application get local guidance from your educational supervisor in their specialty royal college guidance and also specifically your email support from the gmc is readily available be aware of the statistics on application success rate which is published on GMC website on regular basis. Common Caesar application pitfalls and how to avoid them are, there is too much or too little information. The criteria and documentary evidence based on the GMC good medical practice guidelines, previously, which used to be used, was based number one on knowledge, skills and performance, safety and quality, communication, partnership and teamwork, and maintaining trust and 75% of your evidence bundle used to be for domain one. And typically 20% of, of your evidence bundle was for domain two and 5% for domain three and four. So five ways to ensure that you're prepared for Caesar, speak to someone who has successfully done this in your specialty, provide the right amount of evidence, make sure you have all the documentary evidence needed for the cct curriculum don't rush if some information is missing delay your application as it is best to get it right the first time it's an expensive procedure costs over 1600 pounds so best is to get it right the first time and choose your referees carefully the common reasons why applications are unsuccessful is lack of audit experience lack of workplace-based assessment or assessment tools, specializing in one area and not wider knowledge, lack of evidence of research, lack of management and leadership experience, and a full audit cycle is needed. Examples of super specialty, for example, neonatal medicine in pediatrics, lack of experience in anesthetics. So, these are the things you would say you knew before, or at least I knew before I applied. So that's all I have to say, but I'm sure you will listen a, a lot about more of this as we go along. So thank you very much. And put your questions in the chat bar, and hopefully we'll be able to answer all your questions you know, at, at a later time. Thank you. So our next speaker was Glenda Hill. She was supposed to be doing this presentation live, but due to some technical difficulties, she hasn't been able to do it. So we have recorded her presentation. Glenda is an associate specialist in dermatology. She was initially a GP and used to do some clinical sessions in dermatology, but then that created interest in dermatology and then from staff grade to she moved to associate specialist. She works in North Wales and now has got a Caesar going back in 2015. She was also given the best award for clinical service in innovation. As I said, unfortunately due to technical issues, she can't be with us, but she has provided us a video which she has recorded about a journey to Caesar. So we're going to play the clip from her video so, Fiona, if we could download that clip, please, yeah. Yep, it's on the way. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank Raj very much for asking me to speak today at this workshop. I'd also like to thank Raj for all of the hard work that he's done over many, many years uh, to support the SAS cause within Wales as a whole. My name's Dr. Glenda Hill and I'm an Associate Specialist in Dermatology in Wrexham in North Wales. And I've been asked today to talk through my journey 
uh, through the Caesar experience. Here's the timeline of my journey. And as you can see, it started many years ago when I graduated from medical school in Liverpool in 1989 and started a GP vocational training scheme. The jobs that I did as an SHO are depicted here in the orange box, which you can see were quite varied jobs. This was relevant um, as although clearly when you provide evidence for your CESA application, it should be within the last five years, some historical uh, jobs um, and opportunities will also be relevant and may be called upon. And I certainly used my medicine and care of the elderly job uh, to provide some testimonials for me uh, in my application. You can then see that I did qualify as a GP principal and I quickly realised that uh, a lot of consultations in general practice were related to skin and I felt somewhat ill at ease with this because I didn't feel as if I'd been adequately trained in dermatology to provide a good consultation. I therefore sat in with a colleague uh, who is in the box above, who is the first inspirational character that I wanted to highlight. She was a consultant dermatologist working at Wrexham at the time, who, as I say, I sat in with and she taught me. And I felt very inspired by her teaching techniques and really loved the dermatology. So I decided to do a diploma in practical dermatology and to join her as a clinical assistant initially, two afternoons a week, combined with my job share, GP principal job. When I got this diploma in practical dermatology, I actually, this is focused here with the green box because that allowed me, if you like, to get on the bus with regard to my CESAR application, which of course I didn't realise at the time, but having done a postgraduate qualification within dermatology, that allowed me to be uh, enrolled in the CESAR process because you can see from my orange box that I didn't have a dermatology training job for six months, which is the other qualifying criteria I would have required. I then carried on uh, in this combination of two being a GP as well as a clinical assistant for five years until 1999, when I decided in fact to give up general practice and become a full-time SAS doctor within dermatology. This is where I encountered my second inspirational character who's listed at the top, Dr. Sue Jackson who was another SAS clinician whom I met at postgraduate meetings, who actually was really, really very strongly um, positive about the SAS cause, somebody similar to Raj really. And she really allowed me to engage more positively uh, with other perhaps more uncomfortable roles, such as leadership and management roles that I hadn't really considered, including joining committees to support SAS dermatologists. Over that period, I gained discretionary points. And in 2008, I helped to support the SAS doctors within my trust with the negotiation of the new SAS contract as I was the LNC representative for SAS doctors uh, with the um, trust board. I have then ca carried on with my role as an associate specialist. And you can see that in April, 2015, I gained a positive CESAR. From my title at the beginning of the talk, you can see that I also continued as an associate specialist and Raj may have detailed some of the reasons behind that when he gave my introduction today. This is a pre-recording, so uh, unfortunately I can't uh, listen in actively to it live, uh, but um, Raj is aware of my past and the reasons why I have chosen to stay as an associate specialist rather than apply for consultant jobs. So if I go a little bit into my journey, and I've depicted there in the top right hand corner, uh, the, the starting blocks, because this is to remind me just to mention to you that this whole journey is to be considered much more like a marathon than a sprint. 
It really is something that you have to work towards and plan and be very, very organised about. The starting point really is to familiarise yourself with the websites appropriate to CESA, including the GMC and the Joint Royal College of Training Board uh, website. The first question you have to ask yourself is actually, do you fulfil the application requirements? Uh, and as I stated previously within my timeline, that is either a postgraduate qualification in the uh, speciality that you choose or a six month training post uh, having been completed in that speciality. So for me, it was that diploma in practical dermatology that I passed that allowed me to, if you like, step on the CESA bus. It's then important that you download the various curricula that are relevant, including, uh, depending on your specialty, obviously for me, it was the core med medical training uh, guidance, as well as the specialty specific guidance. You really need to be intimately familiar with these uh, so that you are aware of what you're aiming towards and what evidence you need to prove your equivalence. The next point is about hoarding documents. You don't really necessarily realise how important it is that you've kept letters of employment, uh, the, the invitation to join a job, uh, and these are all necessary as proof of your past employment. Thankfully, I've always been somebody who's hoarded things um, and my husband gets quite frustrated about some of the things we've still got at home uh, that I should have thrown away a long time ago. But for me, uh, that meant that I could actually find the original documents. Uh, not easily, I might add, but certainly I was able to find them. Also, keeping things like thank you letters from patients and other things that comment on your skills are a worthwhile thing. For any CESA application, it is evidence that's the key. When I did this, um, it was very much more paper-based, well, entirely really paper-based until the very end of the process. But now you have the e-portfolio, uh, and this is recommended as a source for your storage, which is uh, at a fee, but I, I consider from the colleagues that I know at the moment they're going through CESA, uh, it is a worthwhile fee. It is great for storing all of your evidence. The next thing I would recommend is that you speak to whoever rubber stamps your study leave, so your clinical director, and book yourself onto the recommended courses that you know that the SPRs that are training in the more traditional route within your specialty attend uh, to, to enable them to uh, get adequate proof of training. It's really important that you keep in touch with the SPRs or trainees within your department about these courses and also any training updates so that you are able to buddy along with those uh, and gain equivalent experience. For me, as you can see, the process was a combination of gaining prospective evidence, but also uh, finding retrospective evidence. Um, now, uh, because I really appreciate that a lot of specialties realise that there aren't sufficient training numbers being developed, uh, within their specialities, they are setting up SAS posts specifically uh, for candidates to go through the CESA and therefore uh, qualify ultimately onto the specialist register to allow you to become a consultant. Uh, and these are obviously entirely prospective. And in this case, you should really try to mirror exactly what the SPRs are doing. This, however, might not be as easy when you consider that the SPRs have within their contract a, a very much higher proportion of study leave allowance compared with most SAS doctors. So you will sometimes find, well, quite often find that you are doing uh, these training courses in your own time or booking annual leave to go on special clinic visits to gain uh, the box ticked for that experience. I would also suggest if you know that your trainees within your specialty have to pass their uh, SCE examination, that you look into that curriculum and plan when you're going to sit that and study for it. Certainly within dermatology, this has become mandatory or compulsory for trainees and therefore is the best way of gathering any evidence to prove your knowledge base in the dermatology specialty. 
you also need to get your CV up to date. And by this, it's not just you know the standard CV that you might use for a job application. It's a very specific and structured CV that is the requirement by the GMC. And this lists here the order in which I had to present my CV to the GMC. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of detail there, which you need to uh, look into ensuring that your CV has got all of those facets in it. If you think about your role, it's really a time for you to blow your own trumpet, really, by looking into everything that's involved with your role. Not only the clinical service, but the management and leadership, the teaching and training, and also roles for the wider NHS. With regard to clinical service, clearly there'll be log books and work-based assessments that you collect, as well as collecting evidence about acute or hot cases that you've seen, your involvement in grand rounds and specialist clinics, also other non-patient facing uh, aspects of clinical service, including report writing, audit, publications and presentations. For me, I'm a clinical lead in two roles within my department, uh, the allergy clinic patch testing and also phototherapy service. So I was able to provide evidence of my leadership skills and involvement in MDTs. Also, something you might not necessarily think about is interviewing and being not interviewed, but actually being on the interview panel. And this is something that you need to provide evidence of and therefore uh, is something that you need to consider if there is a new member of staff uh, being employed within the department. Chairing meetings is also something that you should do to prove your leadership skills. And for myself, being the clinical lead uh, and setting up uh, quarterly meetings within the phototherapy service, this was something I was able to uh, prove. Now, uh, the service improvement is the new audit and being able to show that you have uh, assessed a service need and implemented change and have also then assessed the change and the difference that change has made is something that would be positively looked upon and also your communication with other peers. With regard to teaching and training, this applies to all level of staff, including nursing staff in your outpatient clinic, perhaps, or medical students and different styles of teaching and training. So not just clinic based, but also perhaps providing lectures. Asking for feedback within this is key, uh, as this obviously will prov provide your evidence. So what I did was devise a feedback form, a generic one for clinic use, and then another for if you were providing a lecture or a tutorial, so that each of your uh, delegates that attended um, were able to fill in a questionnaire about how they felt your teaching was um, for them. Clearly, obviously, this includes your own CPD. For the wider NHS, there are many roles that you could um, fulfil, but certainly joining committees is something that is worthwhile proving your work in the wider NHS. You really, really do need to be organised. And for myself, uh, at the time of my CESA application, there were 53 uh, dividers that the GMC various different roles were required to collect evidence within. Uh, so I literally at the time of my Caesar, as you can see, which was later on in my uh, life, uh, I the, uh, my children had left home. And so I took over uh, my son's bedroom and literally had these dividers with the titles on them uh, strewn across his uh, bedroom on the bed, on the floor, everywhere, because I knew I didn't need to disturb it. And I could go in there uh, each uh, evening when I felt I was able to uh, add some more detail behind each of these um, title dividers. So uh, I'm sure that there is the equivalent now uh, that you can do online. Also, I would definitely re recommend that you attend workshops this, such as this one. And I recall doing this during my own CESA process um, and certainly uh, a, a workshop such as this at the start, middle and end of your journey is worthwhile. At the beginning, you need to get inspiration and know what to do. In the middle, you need to 
keep on track and be motivated. And at the end, you need to tidy everything up and ensure that everything um, is being kept up to date uh, and that you're abreast of any changes that might have occurred in the rules. With regard to collecting clinical evidence, creating your own logbooks would be worthwhile and obviously storing them on your e-portfolio. The recommendation, certainly at the time I did this, was to analyse one month of your consultation for each of the five years that you submitted evidence. And perhaps in a seasonably variable job, such as in dermatology, we see a lot more lesions in the summer when patients have um, got less clothing on and have noticed a new mole, perhaps. There's different sorts of um, case mix of cases that you would see seasonally. So it would be worthwhile analysing different months, um, not the same month uh, in each of the five years, just to prove that you have got a good case mix. When you collect the logbooks, it's important you collect various issues about the, the cases you've seen, not just the demographics, but also the new to follow up ratio, the complexity of the cases, whether you prescribed complex treatment, whether you needed to consult with the, your consultant about the case or whether you managed it individually and any other characteristics of the case, such as an onward tertiary referral. Similarly, create logbooks of any acute or urgent cases that you see to demonstrate out of hours experience. For myself, obviously, I was already an associate specialist, but I didn't do any on call. And so I needed to prove that I saw acute cases in a different way. And that was where by attending ward referrals um, and asking for case based discussions about that um, uh, with my consultant colleagues. It is also, I felt, worthwhile creating a portfolio of very interesting complex cases just to prove the depth of your knowledge and show how you have monitored and looked after a patient through their whole patient journey. Even you know, if this leads on to a tertiary referral, uh, clearly uh, you can collect evidence to show the whole of the process. For myself, <coughs> I used a... Uh, complexity category that I'd actually devised when I was sat on the uh, All Wales uh, Dermatology Board as the SAS representative. I actually, at the time, I don't know why I did it really, because it was a huge amount of work, but I volunteered to collate data on outpatient case mix for the whole of Wales Dermatology units. Uh, and we collected two weeks of evidence and I collated that and um, had a publication in the British Journal of Dermatology, which was obviously a high profile journal. Uh, so that was not only useful for my application, but also I could use my complexity categories that we used within this paper to highlight the different types of cases that I might see. And there were four levels that we used, routine cases, intermediate cases that required much more um, training uh, and closer supervision by a consultant for untrained individuals, giving examples as I have there. And then the complex category uh, requiring management in a hospital based uh, treatment only under very close supervision by a senior dermatologist um, and examples again have been provided there. The, the fourth complexity category was cases requiring admission. I've just highlighted here in this chart the particular um, complexity categories that I collated evidence on. And you can see at the bottom of this that for the psoriasis patients that I was seeing, um, I had a very high proportion of complexity category three. So that's uh, patients that were uh, needing um, uh, complex uh, tertiary only uh, drugs uh, and that I actually managed uh, the majority of these patients on my own. And I could show that therefore that I was working uh, uh, as an equivalent to uh, you would expect a consultant and certainly a very senior and experienced clinician. Clearly for skin cancer cases that are more the bread and butter of dermatology, this they, they were mainly considered as complexity category one. And you can see that uh, the various different um, categories of disorder that um, I collated the evidence on. And this was a nice pictorial way of demonstrating to the assessor who's assessing your CESAR application uh, about the sort of cases that you see. Uh, and it really is 
essential in my eyes that you provide evidence in a very easy to collate um, way so that it's easy for the person assessing you to say, yes, this person is working at a high level and therefore demonstrates good equivalence. It's really important that you take up any opportunity to participate in 360 degree um, multi-source feedback. And I know now the in Wales, we're using Orbit 360. So it is important that you have, uh, I think for me, I, I put in two um, sources of that over the five years, um, different uh, MSF uh, feedbacks. And obviously you must engage anyway with your appraisals for your revalidation. But it's important in my eyes that you actually use this as an opportunity to really drill down the detail, make sure that you provide good evidence, not just the minimum amount, but um, as much evidence as you can, uh, including your mandatory training, because that actually covers and ticks the box for some otherwise forgotten aspects of uh, the proof you need to provide, such as your training in health and safety, equality and dignity at work, infection control, etc. Because these are are all aspects that you will be asked to prove and have evidence on. Also, during your appraisals, you can uh, negotiate time with your appraiser uh, in your personal development plan for you to work on your CESA preparation. It's also obviously really important that you provide evidence of clinical audit and service improvement and that you do complete the cycle. Just um, providing one audit and then not re-auditing to uh, complete the cycle is not sufficient. You do need to show that you have completed the audit cycle. You should treat any clinical encounter as a potential work-based assessment. Um, unlike the SPRs, you won't be necessarily afforded the time to do this as a specific event. You need to take the opportunities where you can and therefore have printed off forms for um, mini uh, case-based discussions or DOPS, so that if you are in an opportunity um, where you've got a consultant with you and you're presenting a case to them, that you take that uh, opportunity there and then to say, would you mind doing a, a work-based assessment with me on this case? Um, and I would encourage you to use not just one colleague uh, so that they don't feel completely overloaded, but use several consultant colleagues if you have enough in your department so that you can get a broader view on your skills. You should really offer yourself up for various things, such as being an interviewer. If you've got a new secretary or something being appointed in the department, uh, ask um, the manager, could you be on the interview panel? Consider completing medical reports for patients if they come in. And as I said previously, uh, chair meetings if appropriate and if you are able. When I did <clears throat> my CESA, it was necessary to have the medical uh, or clinical director, as well as five senior colleagues who were aware of your working practice. Now, I gather that this is reduced to just four individuals, but it is really, really important that you choose them carefully. Choose people that uh, are aware of your work and, again, make it easy for them to fill in the required document, which is quite lengthy. Um, they need to um, be aware of your CV. And when I sent my CV and the request, I actually reminded them in a, an email of the sorts of activities that they'd witnessed me being involved in. And um, this would help them support uh, with definite evidence uh, the application. Some other tips, really make sure that everything is anonymized and that any patient identifiable information is completely deleted. Now, um, I think now you would need to scan in everything and send it um, electronically. Uh, in my day, obviously, you provided the actual paper copies um, and it was a recommendation I received that you use a wax crayon rather than just a, a felt tip pen to anonymize as some very, very accurate photocopiers can actually pick up behind a, um, a, a an ordinary felt tip pen, whereas a wax crayon is much more dense and therefore less likely to pick up the name. 
the GMC do not look favorably upon you if you do not um, anonymize everything. And it is something that you might need to reflect upon if you by accident do submit anything that has got a patient identifiable um, um, record on it. In my day as well, every single piece of paper that you submitted had to be authenticated, validated, signed and stamped by the appropriate institution, uh, which was quite an onerous task. Um, and I recall spending some time uh, with my main consultant who was supportive of my application, um, helping him to do that. Um, and providing a stamp to at least um, have his um, credentials underneath his signature stamp so that he didn't have to write that on each individual sheet. As I said before, when you've got your sum your summary, um, those 54 dividers, 53 rather dividers that the GMC prov needed, um, you, I provided a summary sh sheet behind each of those um, section dividers so that it was easy for anyone uh, who was assessing my application to see what was behind that. Something that I made a mistake um, of doing, which um, I regretted, was not numbering each individual page uh, that I submitted. I did receive a phone call from my GMC assessor. Uh, I remember it very well. I was in a clinic and it came on my mobile phone. And I was quite surprised to uh, receive this. Um, because it was something that I, I wasn't expecting and hadn't received before, but it was a, a message asking me uh, whereabouts this certain piece of evidence should be placed within my application. And I found it somewhat odd and I never really got to the bottom of why that was required, but I, I, I took it that some of my uh, paperwork got dislodged out of place. Um, and certainly when I received all of my documents back after my successful application, some of it was out of order. So it is important that, you know, when you're scanning it in, um, you make sure it's all numbered so that there's no chance of anything being uh, misplaced or put out of order. Clearly, this is less likely when you're scanning in rather than with hard paper copies. Allow plenty of time to upload your final ev evidence onto the GMC website. Once you've started uh, applying, um, there is a time restriction. So uh, you need to make sure that you don't um, go beyond that. Be aware that when you actually are filling in uh, the text with your application that you are concise because it is text restricted and you need to make sure that when you're highlighting to uh, the GMC what application and what evidence you provided that you do it in a concise manner. For me, uh, at the time, you had to submit it in a paper fashion. And as I say, uh, the recommendation was to use a trustworthy courier. But because I was already in North Wales and not too far from the GMC head office in Manchester, I actually chose to um, uh, ask the GMC if I could have a time slot with them to provide my evidence in person as I had submitted uh, and I'd, I'd put so much effort and work into this that I really didn't want it to go missing. It's really, really important that during this process you stay focused. It's a really arduous task and, as I said, is a marathon rather than a sprint. So you, it is quite easy to drift into inactivity and sometimes think, oh, I really can't carry on with this now and, and give up. But it really is worth it. So please do try to stay focused. And by joining, as I say, um, update meetings such as this, it can be a worthwhile a trigger and um, increase your momentum. Certainly, I'm lucky um, in that the British Association of Dermatologists um, had very much, not necessarily when I first submitted mine, but subsequent to that now for new applicants, have really taken on the CESA uh, process on board. And it's really because uh, the reason I've, I've already discussed with you that the NTN numbers in dermatology are vastly reducing. And to get consultants coming through, they have realised that by um, employing SAS clinicians and helping them through the CESA route, it is a way of getting um, people trained and onto the specialist registers that can then become uh, senior consultants ultimately. So if you go on the BAD website, bad.org.uk, and you come up with this um, screenshot, if you tick on health professionals and click there, 
and then go down to education and then click again on education and you'll get a drop box and you'll get Caesar guidance. Uh, I would suggest that even if you're not in dermatology that you look at this because there's some really useful links there. There's a 24 page guidance document, uh, which I uh, was part of producing. And there's also examples of success successful applications and what you can expect um, from the GMC. This is just a part accepted application showing what will happen when you first submitted your application. As you'll go through today, there are certain time frames within which you'd expect to hear back from the GMC. And when your first um, GMC assessor has looked at your application, they will see if there's anything that the GMC considered deficient and send you back um, a um, document such as this where it's um, highlighted here in blue uh, why it has been returned and what additional evidence you are expected to submit before the GMC are then happy to pass it on to um, the SAC advisors. The uh, BAD have also set up annual CESA workshops um, and also have useful links to uh, the specific guidance and other articles published on CESA. So basically, that's the end of my journey. Um, and as I say, uh, please uh, stick with it. It is worth it. And good luck with your own applications. And thank you again, Raj, for asking me to speak. OK, back over to you, Raj. OK, thank you. Thanks very much, Glenda, for taking time to present. You know, excellent. I'm sure this will help the prospective candidates when they're applying for it. So once again, I know you're not there, but we'll send you a message of thanking you for taking time to do this. So following on from this, our next speaker who's going to take us through his journey to Caesar is Mr. Parin Shah. He is a consultant colorectal surgeon in Royal Glamorgan Hospital. He's also the clinical lead for surgery and appraisal lead. He was one of our clinical tutors prior to acquiring his Caesar in 2014. And he has done an excellent job, really. And he's progressed on very well. So I'll hand it you over to Mr. Parin Shah. Parin, all yours. So take us through your journey through Caesar. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Raj. Uh, let me start my presentation. Uh, I'm not sure whether you can see that at all. Not at the moment, Pari. Okay, I will. Uh, is it, can you see it, Raj? Yeah, it's coming up. Yeah, it's coming yeah, up. So thank you, uh, Thanks a lot. Thanks for giving me this chance to uh, talk about my experience. Um, <clears throat> uh, my journey started, I would say, back in 2000 when I passed my uh, master in general surgery from back in Mumbai. And I met this gentleman who is actually was an associate specialist then and remained an associate specialist till he moved to India. And he, I went to see him saying, I want to go to UK. I want to have a good training. And he sat down with a small piece of post-it and he actually wrote different types of training saying, you got FTTA and you got a specialist register and you got to go through a specialist register to get into a consultant job. And he talked about research. So I kept that paper all throughout my life till I got my Caesar. And then I sent it to him saying, thank you very much for your help. So I think my journey started from there that I want to come to UK and, and I want to be a consultant here. Why I want to be a consultant? Because I want to earn that self-respect. I want to have that recognition in the NHS that I have done the hard work and I can come to the podium and provide that service and training to my junior colleagues. And the second reason is that, yes, you want to be a consultant surgeon. Uh, some people will say that, yes, you'll have a better paid eyes, maybe an optional. Some people say you can do private practice. I don't believe in private practice. But there are other perks as well when you be a consultant. I had opportunities. I had plenty of opportunities uh, in my life. So in, when I was doing my MRCS, my form was rejected. And they say, you're not eligible to be giving this exam, so you can't. And five days, exactly five days, but I remember Thursday evening at 10 o'clock, which is 5 o'clock at the Royal, uh, UK time, I had an email saying, Sorry, we've reassessed your application. We've had a comments from your supervisor. You are eligible for the exams. You come in one day and give the exams. So there I go Monday from Mumbai to Delhi to give my exams. And I passed my exams in first go. There was no looking back. Came to UK, stayed in Wales, and I started doing my research, 
job. And I started applying for numbers. So I, I applied for a number in Southwest and Wales and they, they offered me LAT and I could not take LAT because I was doing research. I said, give me a number, I'll take it. And they would not give me a number. And I was never ever shortlisted again in those degrees to go for a job. I must say given 40 plus interviews during my first four years of my non-training career, you know, my, uh, my specialty doctor career, and I did not even convert single interview into a training number. So you can see how much heartbreaking it is when you actually can deliver it and you see your colleagues going through the system and they can get training numbers and they come out to be as consultant surgeons where you can't get that opportunity. So I decided, no, I'm going to stay down. I'm going to find a mentor and I'm going to stick with him to get my training, what I wanted. I want to be a consultant surgeon. I said, I'm going to do that at any cost. And I took up a permanent job in 2006. And by 2013, I got my necessary experience. I applied for it and I got my Caesar in February 2000. 14, and I got a locum consultant job to work in the same health board by a different hospital to develop a service as a locum consultant, as an associate specialist. So, you know, as says doctors, we are 20% of NHS workforce. You know, we provide that continuity balance and the potential you guys have got is absolutely amazing. Uh, I'm sure you guys know about it uh, um, and the skill mix you've got. I've currently got uh, four of the non-training doctors in my department. I've got five trainee doctors. And to be honest with you, they all are equally good and I could rely on any of them to treat me. Uh, but what we miss is the motivation. And I think that has been the major factor then. The, the progression was not clearly defined. Uh, the GMC was giving a lot of support in terms of Caesar, but there was not, not many people going through. I mean, surgery was really dry. I can't remember on my fingertips how many surgeons who were Raj was one of them. I think Raj was one of the earliest ones. And I think Tony Joseph was the other one from my department that that back, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Raj, 15 years before I got my Caesar, at least 10 to 15 years, I would think. So there was no guidance, but the motivation is a major factor in SS doctors that they don't want to do things. They don't want to do the hard work. And plus they've got other problems. That's why they probably SS as well. They've got their family life and other things they want to focus on. So I was looking at the numbers and I was quite impressed that uh, going back in 2014, when I applied for Caesar, uh, the success was, was less than 50%, but now it's down to 50 to 60% in almost all the specialties. So GMC is doing a lot of hard work in uh, guiding the people together. Lots of Royal Colleges are working. There are lots of people who are there who are providing support to their colleague. And Dina is helping, you know, Raj has done presentations for so many years in guiding uh, and giving the experiences about Caesar to all our SAS doctors in Wales. So my question, I would say, I would ask you, start with the basics. Sir. You want to be an S, uh, go through Caesar, you want to be a consultant. Have you got this? This are some of the key things I would look for it. Have you done any higher degree, like an MSc or MPhil or a, some degree in terms of a training from Royal Colleges? Lots of opportunities you can do. Uh, there are lots of free degrees you can do. Um, I did my higher degree. I did a formal research here and I did back home as well. And uh, I got tons of publications from it. So publication is something else you do to recognize yourself and say that you can uh, go through Caesar. And when I was applying for my application, I had at least 15 pages in my CVA for pages of full of publication presentations, posters. Um, audit is another important, complete the loop. And as Glenda said, a lot about service changes, service development, quality improvement. I think that is the key. It's not just completing the loop for the sake of loop. Show that you made some changes in your department. I think that is another key thing. Exam is must, absolutely. The people say that, yes, uh, uh, you know, for Caesar, you don't need to pass your exams in general surgery. But if I was appointing somebody as a consultant surgeon, I want him to pass his exams before I appoint him. So I would say exams are mandatory, whatever it says, you must do it. It's not a desire. It's not desirable. It's an essential criteria for it. The other thing is about management courses. So ILM used to do management courses in Wales. And I remember back in 2008 and nine, uh, they did some level two, level three training for the health board. It was free for all of us. It was a Welsh degree initiative. I was the only clinician who registered for it and I got my degree. And I think that helped me a lot to show I provide all the aspects I required for my CESA application. Um, we talked a lot about work-based assessments, not just you are doing it, but also you should be assessing for your juniors as well. Back in 2014, I think uh, WBAs were only meant for the trainees. Uh, the ICP wasn't pictured, they had just started. And I don't think any of the SAS doctors were doing it. I think 
if I'm not mistaken, Raj started an initiative in Wales Deanery as well. They, they enrolled some of ISAS doctors for the pilot doing the ISCP. I was one of those pilots. And I was doing my CES at that time anyway. I think it was 12, 13. So I enrolled for the for the pilot. I did all my WPAs. And uh, I think I had an assessor from Cardiff as well who would look into and guide me as well. And the most important thing is look at your curriculum and get experience in all the fields of specialty before you make your application. These are some of the reasons why you don't get Caesar, and, and you can pretty much say, you know, it's WBA audit research, um, index procedures, particularly for the surgeons. If you haven't done necessary procedures, you are unlikely to get your application through. Um, complaints, failure to show the engagement with that process, failure to show the learning events from it. I think that's another pitfalls you've got. And the other thing is, if you don't have evidence of management leadership, you're probably not likely to go through as well. So you've got to show that experience. My application was paper-based like Glenda. My application was probably thousand pages. I think that would say, I think things have changed from there on. Um, the, the amount of evidence is, is more tailored now as compared to what it was before. So, as I said, my planning started back when I came to UK and uh, I got a specialty doctor in 2008 and I became an associate specialist within 2009. And my clinical director then actually asked me why you want to be an associate specialist. And I told him that I want to progress to be a consultant and the window of opportunity will open. And when I want to be ready, I want to do independent lists and I want to have recognition. And he said, fine, I will sign the application. And I caught that. I did everything else which nobody else wanted to do. So you have to identify in your department, what is your workload of your colleagues? What is the workload of your consultants and what they don't want to do? Things like mortality review. They don't have time for this. They don't have time for going for these user group meetings because they've got important things to do with scope. So I think you need, if you're an endoscopy user, why don't you go for a meeting instead of sending one of your consultant colleagues for it? Managing the rota, who wants to manage? Nobody has time to manage the rota. Why don't you pick it on? So I picked up rota management. I was doing mortality reviews. I was doing endoscopy user group meetings for them. And I was representing the surgical department in all those areas. I went on a lot of courses, yes, tons of them. Any other free course I would find, I would go for it. But I organized a lot of courses as well. So I used to be a, a, a Vimat used to be a home for me. So I used to go for a lot of teaching surgical courses, basic surgical skills, advanced surgical skills in Vimat. I used to organize all skills uh, courses in Prince Charles Hospital. So we used to run a laparoscopic masterclass, which I did for many years. And I'm still one of the, uh, the person who organizes them. And actually now I'm the faculty on it. We also run the enhanced recovery courses and courses for the nurses and the course for the complaints for the whole hospital. So I, I just could find a thing and I would just sit down and organize a course and get the right people involved and open it for the whole hospital to join. It, I would say it was a piece of cake and I don't think it was any hard work involved. I was also one of the first SAS tutors uh, when they were appointed. And I think I was, I was really honored to be appointed. In fact, to be honest with you, I wasn't going to go for it. I was so much focused on my clinical work and my season. I never thought about it that I could be an SAS tutor. And it is one of my colleagues who actually said that, have you seen the application? It was it was two days before the, the deadline. And he said, why are you not applying? He said, you can. And I thought, this is going to be a busy job. I said, yeah. I said, yes, we will support you. Do it. And, and, and then I applied and I got the job. But none of this would, I would say, would happen on my weekdays. This is all working Saturdays and then on my time, on my me time, to be honest with you. And, and I think you should be prepared to spend your, your, a lot of your personal time to achieve this goal. Some of the tips I would say, you know, I think I would just reiterating the things which everybody else has said. Look at your specialty specific guidance. Um, it is changing all the time. Look at what you need to get your Caesar. And as Raj said in his presentation, delay application if required. I was literally tortured, I would say, by all my colleagues saying, why are you not applying? You ready? And I said, no, I'm not ready till I see my application is ready. And I think I must have delayed my application by at least one year till I get Till I was confident I had got all the evidence I would apply. And the reason I say I knew it is because when I applied and sent my application across to GMC, I exactly knew what is going to come back from GNC. The two things was going to come back was verification of my Indian experience and verification of my lat from base middle and Zindri, which was not verified. I knew. And that's the only two things was sent back to me. They need to do this. And guess what? Between those period of assessment of four weeks, I was ready with those things. So as soon as the paperwork came back to me, Within a week, paper went back to them. Thank you very much. I've done it. And, I, and there was no looking back. 
uh, GMC organizes a lot of websites and they've got, they've got a good website. They've got lots of seminars they were doing then also about Caesar. And I would strongly recommend you to go on that. It just gives you a lot of information and a good guidance to go with. Select your reference as well. I think you need four now. We could, we could put six or eight, I think. Um, I had surgeons, I had my medical director, I had my clinical director, I had um, I had AMD for appraisal and revalidation because I was an appraiser then. So in fact, I was an appraiser and if I'm not mistaken, I was appraisal lead also. So I had involved him as well to be one of my referees. So select your referees very well. Certainly have one from your allied specialty. I would strongly recommend because um, GMC is not looking for what you've done in your specialty, but how you work with cross specialty as well. And to have somebody like a physician giving you a reference that you're fit to be a surgeon is really, really, really great on your CV. Uh, email is a huge resource. Save it. I've had every email saved in my box since I've um, started as uh, as a clinical fellow and an and a specialty doctor. Things like a comment from your um, directed manager saying well done or or good job or you've done some changes or you manage the rota and they send things back to you. You can and imagine use those comments rather than just using thank you cards from your patients because that gives you a length and breadth of your experience across in the health board, not just clinical but managerial as well. And your service side as well that yes, you can do things and that you will recognize as uh, as a person in your department. Glenda highlighted about rewriting your CV. I must have written CV a couple of times actually, and I showed it to a lot of people to say, does it look good? Does it change? And, I, and, and it's every single point is there. So, you know, you have to write about your, your prizes, you have to write about your achievements, you have to write about your goal, your extracurricular activities, your publications, presentations. I, I did a nice thing about my courses, but I divided them into clinical courses, managerial courses, service development courses, teaching courses. So when somebody is looking at your CV, he's not finding things. You have to show them what you've got. And you're simplifying and saying in a nice template that this is I've got, and you look into it. Talk to friends. I didn't have many friends to talk to because uh, none of my friend had got a Caesar, but now there is an opportunity to talk to your friends, talk to, talk to random people. I still get inquiries from a lot of my colleagues across and a lot of random people from across uh, all of UK about Caesar, and I still give them advice and send my applications and I'll have a look at the applications. Now, GMC allocates uh, a specialist um, application advisor for you, and I think he's your friend. So even if he tells you something is not right, please take it very seriously, okay, because he's giving you absolute right advice. I would say that my clinic, my specialist advisor is currently actually present in the meeting and I won't say his name. I'll probably send him a message afterwards. Not relevant because we're not validating the evidence uh, like we used to do before. But remember, those thousand pages were validated by my consultant without binging, without crumbling. That means they wanted me to do it. And I think once you once you get to that level, I think you've achieved something in your department. But I was I was going to come to what those two things about um, the distant verification, which doesn't need now. It's relevant then because it would not happen then. So my Midlands experience was. Um, could not be verified because my program director had moved to New Zealand and the local program director, although he recognized it, I would say it wasn't very enthusiastic to do the way it is, you know, 15, 20 pages, hospital stamp, name and everything else. He said no. So I spoke to the advisor and I came with an idea saying that if I send all my evidence to him by email and tell him that he verifies this via email, would GMC accept it? And GMC accepted that. It had to go from him to say that this is a true evidence, a true copy, and I verify this evidence. Now it's it's online, so you don't have to worry about it. It's all verified by online, and you just have to click the button. But I think I was lucky to have those verified then. The other thing is about your logbook, your experience, especially important for the for the surgical specialty is that you have to tailor your logbook accordingly. I had a logbook of 15 pages in every single specialty listed. Every single specialty I had operation, which were index operations on the top. So when the assessor is looking at my application, it had an index as well in the front that the page number of my general surgery is page one, colorectal is page two, my endoscopy experience is page so and so. So he could just open the first page of my Excel sheet and say, okay, I want to look at his endoscopy experience. He would turn to page seven, look at it. Oh my God, you got colonoscopy so and so index required. So he's, he's got it. So I made my I made life so much easy for the assessor. Okay, because I knew what he's looking for. I, there's everything there in your document, what he's looking for. If they're asking for some evidence, they're looking for it. You have to highlight that in a particular way. I also did a nice summary of my last five years of experience, listing all the operations in detail. 
and the amount of operation I've done every year. So they could see it. I also did a nice consolidated summary of all my surgical experience, not just last five years to see what is my length and breadth of experience, how much workload, how much operating I've done. And I think that helps a lot for the assessor um, to go through your evidence and, and, and say, yes, uh, you know, it's, it's easy. I would say GMC takes this very, very seriously. I would take this very seriously. You cannot have any identifiable information at all. Check, double check, triple check, you have to do it. It's a lot of things uploaded now. Uh, Glenda said use crayons. What I did was I used all the, all the evidence, you know, most of the evidence is in um, on the Word document. So I made it all blank. And uh, I obviously, I got my wife to go through all of my evidence second time to make sure everything. I went through a couple of times to make sure there's not a single mistake has happened. Fortunately, in my application, there was no issue at all. There was no confidential issue. And there's a courses for confidentiality. I would strongly recommend you to go on that. That's a, certainly a very good evidence for patient safety. It can go in your domain too, and it can also go in domain four. Triangulation. I want to highlight about your triangulation. It's it's all about, you know, it's just not sending an application saying, okay, this is why 800 pages you've asked for. No. We, just, we had to submit case histories then. Uh, I had complications then. The MDT letters were there. Some of those MDT letters for cancer patients, I had done surgery on them. Some of them had complications. So what I did was I took the opportunity to triangulate some of the evidence. So every time there would be an MDT letter I would there. I would send an MD letter, but I would make a note at the bottom for my assessor that this is triangulated here. I was involved in this case. I've done this. This patient has got an MDT letter, page so-and-so in my document. I've done surgery on this patient, page so-and-so on the logbook, number so-and-so. So everything was so much nicely triangulated that my assessor could see that, yes, I've done the surgery. I've done the index procedure. I've had a complication. I've managed that. I've written that to GP. And if I had a complaint, I've triangulated there, where are my learning points? Have I gone on a course to learn something about that? And it's it's all there. The whole thing was like a nice maze where you could go from one point to two point. And I would actually guide him to go there and show him what I wanted him to see. And that's how your application should be. Raj talked about this, and I'm not going to talk in detail about domains. I think the original Caesar application uh, was fully based on current appraisal thing. Uh, when I got it, James, he was coming out with uh, compulsory titular appraisal revalidation. Uh, the whole of the process was based on this. CISA was based on this. Very few would have done appraisals before 2013. I was one of them. I had regular appraisals. I made a point to do it because I knew that when I apply for my CISA, that would be counted towards is that I was re regularly assessed by my colleagues. Old days was a piece of paper and that I was fit to practice and I was doing everything I need to do to improve myself to achieve that goal. So when I applied for application, I was one of the I don't know whether other people had it, but I had my appraisal inside and I had at least three or four appraisal which went in as an evidence. So look at your syllabus, exams as I said is must. WBAs is level three and four is must. You have to have level three and four, definitely level four in your index procedures. If you haven't done it, I would not give somebody a consultant job. So why would you get it from, from GMC? So make sure you do that. Courses, as I said, we, we discuss about how to classify them. Diploma management is something I think you must do it. Research, um, as I said, you do it in your me time. There are lots of opportunities. Open the BMG articles, there are lots of, you know, do it online. The things have changed. There's LinkedIn, there are various jobs going for research. Look into it, learn about statistics, do some statistical courses as well. Publish if you can, as much as you can, and present in the local meetings, regional meetings, you know, wherever you get a chance, you've got you got a local R&D meeting as well. Uh, I got a first prize in every single R&D meeting in the hospital for the first four years because I used to, the only one was to submit things. I used to publish like crazy. And I used to do that. And I used to get prize every single year. So I had prizes as well listed on it. Till they realized that I'm the only one who's getting and then they changed slightly criteria that you have to register for research to do it. And obviously I was not registering for my research. That was my weakness. And I would just do a shortcut to say, I've done the work, I'll send it off. Assess your juniors, so help your juniors. You're teaching them anyway. So why didn't you give them a form to say assess your teaching? Why don't you do your WBAs for them? So you encourage both ways. If somebody's encouraging you to do your WBAs, you encourage others to do WBAs as well. And that should then go as your evidence as well that you you know how to teach and that's a, that's a, that's a way of assessing people. 
interviews. Um, not many people will do that. It's sort of a leadership skill where actually you take an opportunity to say that, yes, I will appoint a locum SHO doctor or a locum co-trainee or a locum F1 for my department. Why would I waste a considerable time to go for the interview and shortlisting? I will do the shortlisting. I will learn that process. I will do the interviews along with someone else. So as a, as a, as a ROTA organizer and as a specialist, I used to be routinely on interview panel because I wanted to appoint people who could do the job. And I wanted to get the process quicker because I didn't want to wait for people to have time in, in the job plan to go for the interview and things. I would just do it. Keep a record of your cases and MDT letters. Get involved in the MDTs. Uh, important for people, surgeons like me, who have cancer meeting every year, I would take lead. And I've taken lead all my life. Since I started day one, I would present them, I would do the letters. So that's the only way I could learn. If you can remember, I used to do all the complaints for my consultants all my life as an associate specialist. That's, I used to tell him that any complaint you get for yourself, you give it to me, let me summarize it. Nice way to learn. Teaching um, is good to get a teach feedback about your own teaching skills. So, you know, you could have a certificate, but always when you teach something, give a small, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> ask for the feedback and collect those feedback and collect it. So you can actually put that into your, into your, uh, into your application as well. Any evidence of independent activity, I would not miss it at all. So if you do an endoscopy list or if you do a clinic for dermatology for excision of small lumps and bumps, anything else, I would say keep that activity. Um, hi, Parin. I, it's, I, hi, Parin. Can you hear me? It's Carolyn here. Hi. Hi. So we've more or less run out of time. I'm so sorry. That's all right. I will stop it. Are we able to finish no, no. it? And we can send the rest of well, the whole presentation out. But, but in, don't stop see? it. Yeah. Don't stop it. Just sort of try and wrap it up in the next five minutes or so, please. Yeah, that's fine. Sorry, no problem. And then we'll send Thank the presentation you. over to the delegates. Probably, I, I just lost some time. So I'll, I'll skip that. So I think domain one is the same thing. We talked about audit and safety. I won't change that. This are the evidence of communication. So it, you, you've got it anyway. And management of trust where you could include your vaccination as well, which you've taken for it. I had some of the challenges, you know, and I'd overcome them. Uh, so yeah, I've talked about that anyway. Thanks to it, that's Prof. Hare, whom who was one of my mentors, and I'm one of the registrars who come out of the department as uh, as a consultant. And there are four of us who've come out totally. Three came out after me, and the last one got um, his Caesar application through just last week. And I can see that some of the other guys who supported me, thanks to my wife and kids, but lots of hospital staff and managers supported me and guided me as well, and gave me the evidence I required. So yes, my journey was enjoyable. I had a lot of hard work, very satisfying. And I will do it again if I have to do it at any cost. Um, the journey doesn't end here. People will say your journey stops at Caesar, but I would say it continues on. Uh, I had an interview, I had a strong competition. Um, I was meant to get a general surgery job. I topped my interview and they had to give me a colorectal job and they converted all the job to colorectal eventually and appointed all three of us who was on the interview panel. So from there, I became a surgical tutor for the trainees. I designed, again, the Neurota for all the junior doctors. I established laparoscopic colorectal service. I'm currently the appraisal lead for RTILG, and I'm the clinical lead for general surgery appointed only two weeks ago. So my journey hasn't ended. I want to keep on progressing myself to achieve my goal. My email address, and I've got a blog as well. So if anybody wants anything else, there is an email address. You can contact me, and I'll help them out whatever I can. Thank you very much, guys. I'm sorry about running over. Okay, thanks, Dean, for an excellent presentation and in detailed presentation about taking you through your journey. And I'm very grateful. And it was nice catching up with you. But don't worry, you know, sometimes, you know, when you're actually doing the presentation from the heart, it, it overruns. So I won't worry about that too much. Once again, thank you very much, Pareen, and hope to see you. Thank you, Raj. Okay, all the best, Pareen, all the best. So next, I think we have got a break actually for about 10 minutes. So can we just cut that break down to five minutes? And then basically we will, it is 10.35 at the moment. So can we get back at about 10.40 and then we can basically start with the GMC who are going to present on the application process. So please stay on, don't sort of run away, have a comfort break or make yourself a quick cup of coffee. What we will do if you are all agreeable we could take the second break out, you know, between 11.50 to 11.55 and continue on from the breakout sessions. So I think that might be a best idea to catch up with some time. So have a good five minutes break and I'll see you soon.
So have we got Tom ready for his presentation? I see if he's in the room. Just bear with me one second. And this everybody stays in the main sort of room, so there's no breakout room yet. Uh, it's um, Peter giving the presentation. Peter, is it? Yeah. Okay. So um, if you could Peter, bring him on, please. Yeah. Yeah, Peter, give me a second. I'm just going to change your settings. I think you logged out and back in again, which is why it's um, reset you. I'm just going to make you a co-host again. That's wonderful. Thank you. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Thank you, Peter. Thank you. So Peter is going to give us a presentation on the application process. There are a couple of questions that have already come in. Would you want to take them after your presentation or would you want to leave it right to the end? I I think just conscious of time, I think um, unless uh, there's anything really burning, um, no. I think we should probably uh, just just keep questions okay. to the end. And um, okay. I'm sure That's during fine. the breakout sessions um, with the with the specialist application advisor, there should be plenty of opportunity to, to okay. ask some questions Excellent. there as well. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, carry on. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for thanks for inviting us um, and involving us in this session today. It's always um, it's always a pleasure to come and be involved and, and share some of the the knowledge that we have on the process. So, I've got a brief presentation first, and I'll, so I'll just look to share that with you. You're right, Tommy. Is that is that showing on the screen? Okay, for everyone. Uh, we're seeing your PowerPoint screen, but it's not on slideshow mode at the moment. Okay. Is that working? Um, so I can see your presenter view. Um, if you go to, um, yeah, that's it there. Perfect. Lovely, thank you. <laughs> thank you, I always struggle with the, the technical things. Um, so uh, we're here from the, the specialist applications team today at the GMC. Um, so as I say, I've just got a brief sort of few slides, about 20 slides or so, just on some of the, the key points in terms of applying for a CESA with the GMC. And then, um, Hopefully, what what you're going to find really helpful, particularly this afternoon, is some um, some specific time with the the specialist applications advisors. So you'll be put into some dedicated group sessions with them, um, and uh, they'll run through some of the key guidance with you and uh, and some of the the really important information that you should take on board in terms of preparing preparing your application for CESA. Um, so. I appreciate that some of this information you may already be aware of or may have been said in some of the presentations that I've just that I've just followed, but um just for completeness. So a Caesar, as we call it, is is a certificate of eligibility for specialist registration. And it's essentially an application route that's open to doctors uh, to apply for specialist registration with the GMC. So you must be on the GMC specialist register. Uh, if you want to work in, as a substantive consultant post, essentially in the NHS at some point in your career, perhaps in the future. So this application gives doctors an opportunity to apply for, for that type of registration and that recognition. Um, and it's really designed as an alternative or an equivalence route to, to the standard training route in the UK, the, the CCT, the Certificate of Completion of Training route. So if a doctor hasn't fulfilled that, uh, training program route in the UK, then it is open to them to to apply through this equivalence based process. 
And ultimately, it's all based on an applicant presenting um, a robust and quite extensive portfolio of evidence um, that that demonstrates all the competencies and the standards required by this the UK CCT curriculum for the specialty that they're applying in. Um, so it's not an inferior route to the CCT. It's it, we hold it to exactly the same standard and. It leads to the same goal, which is specialist registration with the GMC, and that gives you that opportunity to work as a consultant in the NHS. Um, and it's it's based on evidence. So, as I say, an applicant needs to put forward evidence that demonstrates that they are currently competent in all the competencies required by the current curriculum for their particular specialty. Um, there's a couple of points I've, I've just highlighted at the bottom there, um, and. Uh, this doesn't happen in every scenario, but it's it's, it's something that we've maybe noted um, and it's worth sharing it, I think, which is that CESA isn't purely um, an assessment of your competency in your current, uh, your current role or your current responsibilities in your current job, for example. Um, it's very likely that your, your recent or your current role uh, will certainly be beneficial for your CESA application, um, but the assessment criteria isn't what your current role uh, it requires you to do or gives you opportunity to do. And it's important to think about that in terms of gathering and preparing your application. Um, the assessment standard is that full curriculum. Um, so you have to think about that quite carefully, we say to applicants when, when you're thinking about preparing and applying for CESA potentially, is you almost need to do a bit of an assessment um, in terms of think about what, what, where you're getting your evidence and your competencies from, and that has to fulfill the entirety of that curriculum. Um, so it's not just about whether you you have the opportunity, for example, to do this in your current place of work. Um, it's based on the curriculum requirements and you need to demonstrate all of those to be successful in the application. Um, and it's not purely based though there is a place for these in the application on on what we'd regard as secondary evidence in terms of perhaps a recommendation or a, a testimonial or a reference from from some colleagues that you work with or you have worked with. Um, so there is a specific place in the application for that type of evidence, um, but the, the, the key focus is in terms of our assessment of your application will be looking at the primary day-to-day -day, uh, work that you do in terms of the evidence. Does that demonstrate the requirements in the curriculum? So things in terms of primary evidence, that would be things like um, appraisals, uh, log books, clinical correspondence, et cetera, workplace-based assessments that demonstrate the competencies in the curriculum. Um, we get quite a few of these applications every year and they have um, been increasing in terms of the number that we've received year on year. Uh, so last year, for example, 2020, we, we had just, just shy of a thousand applications in total. Um, and I think we're certainly on track to, to hit that this year. Um, we, in terms of the breakdown, uh, just, just for awareness really, and I, I'm aware that there's uh, quite a mix of different specialties pre present at this uh, session today. Um, we get we get applications in all different types of specialties. Um, there's essentially about 65 approved CCT specialties in the UK that that can be applied for a CESAR in, uh, but we tend to get a higher proportion, for example, in surgical specialties, physicianally based specialties. But we do get them across the breadth um, of the specialties. There's um, an eligibility requirement. Uh, so you have to fulfill this. It's quite straightforward to fulfill it, but it's important that you, you're aware of what it is and you demonstrate this and meet it as part of your application for CESA. Um, so this forms part of the legislation um, that kind of underpins the, the CESA process. Um, and essentially, at some point in your career, if you're looking to apply in a CCT specialty, so something like um, anaesthetics, for example, it's a CCT specialty in the UK, at some point in your career, whether that's here in the UK or perhaps you've worked somewhere else in the world, you must have done a post of at least six months uh, in an approved training post for that specialty or a specialist qualification in that specialty that you're applying in. So, for example, if you're looking to apply for CESA in the specialty of anaesthetics, then we would expect you to present evidence that either you've got a specialist medical qualification, such as the, the fellowship qualification of the Royal College of Anesthesia. Um, that could be uh, another qualification as long as it's in that specialty or a training post. So post that's approved for training. So in the UK, that would be something like um, 
a specialist training post, an SHO post, a registrar post, um, or something similar outside of the UK. There is um, potentially an opportunity to apply in a specialty that isn't sort of a full approved CCT specialty by itself. Um, if, if this is something that you're interested in, then what I'd say is, um, is, is the eligibility requirements are very are quite specific um, and not everyone will be able to demonstrate these. So if that's something you're interested in, then your best point of call really is to get in touch with the GMC um, ahead of preparing an application to see if your particular specialty is appropriate and whether you would meet that eligibility requirement um, because it is very specific. Um, to give you a flavor, so in the past, um, and we get very few of these applications a year, but uh, we, they tend to be in sort of more established subspecialty areas of, of the parent CCT specialty curriculum. So, for example, we've had uh, non-CCT application specialties in, in, for example, breast surgery, which is like a specialist interest area of the, of the general surgery curriculum. Um, so I, I'm not going to go through what they all are now, but... Um, but you're best to sort of contact the GMC um, separately to see if, if that's an option for you really. The application itself um, is an online application. So you submit that through your GMC online account. Um, it's very straightforward to set up an account uh, if you don't have one already, though most, most doctors working in the UK will have one. Um, and it's essentially a a self-service facility where you can view details of your registration with the GMC, uh, you can pay fees, that kind of thing, uh, but you can also apply for registration, specifically special, specialist registration through the CESA process. Um, and you have up to 12 months in terms of the online application to do that. Um, and uh, if you don't, if you haven't received your online application, within 12 months of you sort of opening it, opening it up on the system, then it's likely we'll be in contact with you around that time, ultimately to understand are you, are you looking to apply imminently? Um, and that's really because we don't want lots of sort of inactive applications in the system. And it's helpful for us to plan ahead in terms of uh, how many applications we can anticipate we're going to receive, what specialties they're in, that type of thing. Um, there is an application fee, um, and the current fee for, for a CESAR is, is £1,676. So um, I'm sure quite, quite an amount of money, and obviously you'll, you'll incur other costs associated with this process and time, etc. Um, the, the key thing is it's really important that you, you, um, you don't apply prematurely, you don't rush this application, you take your time um, to understand what's involved and, and you prepare your application thoroughly. And ultimately, you submit it once you are personally satisfied that I have a comprehensive application, I've fulfilled that curriculum, I've provided all the type of evidence that's expected, uh, and I'm satisfied it's a good application. There's a slide here. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see that, but um, I'm going to break it down over the, some of the next few slides into three sort of key stages. But what this slide is designed to do is essentially just give you an idea of the general time frame of the application process and how long roughly it takes from the point uh, an applicant submits their application to the GMC up until the point the GMC issue a decision on that application. Um, and on average, um, in normal circumstances, it, it roughly takes um, sometimes a bit less, sometimes a bit more, about six months uh, for, for that cycle to complete. Um, we have certainly experienced some, some delays um, at various stages of the process, um, particularly over the last 18 months um, due, to, uh, due, due to COVID-19, et cetera, and, and factors that have come out of that. But in, in normal circumstances, it, it generally takes about six months. Um, and the three key stages are essentially um, once you've submitted your application online, you've uploaded all your electronic evidence to that application, you've paid the application fee, and you're, you're satisfied that you're ready to apply, um, we receive your application at the GMC and, and we'll complete an initial assessment on it. And then the next stage, um, and I'll talk about these in a bit more detail shortly, um, is that uh, your application will have been assigned to an advisor in the team and they will review your evidence submission. So a bit of a pre-assessment before it's sent for the evaluation stage. And that being the third stage, is, is the evaluation of, of your evidence against the curriculum. And we engage the expertise of the relevant Royal College for your specialty in that process. Um, and I'll just 
touch on some of these um, over the next few slides in a bit more detail. Um, in terms of submission of your evidence, um, you, you may have heard from some, some prior applicants that have been successful through this process today um, about submitting evidence in hard copy and practicalities about that. Um, we would recommend, and you can now certainly um, pretty much exclusively upload all of your evidence electronically uh, to the GMC online application. And there's, there's a lot of benefits in terms of supplying your evidence electronically. Um, you can sort of take the advantage of, and we certainly recommend um, like PDF software, um, one being the, the Adobe PDF. Um, that's a, a real good tool essentially to, to organize uh, your evidence. Um, you can group your evidence together, for example, by a certain area of the, of the curriculum or the guidance um, or by the particular hospital or the organization that you're drawing some of your evidence from. Uh, you can group evidence together. So for example, um, you may have a series of, of workplace-based assessments that you collate in to demonstrate a certain area of the curriculum and your comp current competence in relation to that. Um, so what we don't want you to do, for example, is upload every workplace-based assessment as a single attachment to the GMC system. You, you almost need to coordinate and organize your evidence electronically outside of the GMC system um, and then move it into there at a later date once you've got it in an organized manner. So something like Adobe PDF is great for kind of organizing your electronic evidence. Um, a lot of applicants' evidence um, tends to be electronic these days. Uh, so they're using online e-portfolio systems, their appraisal records for revalidation on there, CBD records, et cetera. So you need to sort of organize in terms of downloading that from all the different relevant systems. Um, but electronic evidence is certainly um, is certainly the way forward and we, we'd highly recommend you use that. You can also use, for example, the Adobe PDF Reader to, um, to redact uh, your evidence electronically. So all of your evidence, for example, if there's any patient or sensitive data in that, uh, it, that information needs to be securely re thoroughly redacted uh, by you before you put it into the GMC system. Um, I said I'd talk about kind of these three stages. Um, so the first stage, as I say, is initial assessment. So you've submitted your application online, you've uploaded all your evidence, uh, you've paid the application fee, et cetera. Um, and then we assign your application to an advisor in the team. And then they will complete an initial assessment or an eligibility assessment in terms of the, based on the information that you put in your online application. Uh, so they'll check, for example, are you eligible? So have you got a specialist qualification or a six month training post? Uh, from some point in your career uh, within your application and your specialty. Uh, it says structured reports and verifiers here, and I'll touch on these over the next couple of slides, but it's essentially there's a, a requirement and an opportunity for you to nominate people to verify the, the authenticity of your evidence and also act as a, a referee uh, to comment on your capabilities in relation to the curriculum. So there's place in the application for you to tell us who the referees are that you nominated and who the people are that are verifying your evidence. Uh, so we'll expect to receive all that information within your application. And if you've got any questions, your advisor will be in contact with you by, by, their e by your email address. Uh, the next stage is once we've gone through that process, we're content you're eligible, that your referees, your verifiers, et cetera, are all up to date and fine. Uh, your advisor roughly after about a month will uh, review all of the evidence that you've uploaded into your application. And essentially what they're doing here is, is a quality check and giving you an opportunity um, to receive some feedback from them and draw on their expertise as processing these applications before we sort of get your application together to share it with the relevant college for the specialist evaluation. Um, and what the advisor generally is doing is, is checking uh, a lot of the information that is available to you up front as an applicant before you apply. So you should certainly invest your time in reviewing all the type of guidance in terms of the suggestion, the evidence that we recommend you put forward, uh, getting your evidence verified, etc. cetera. Um, do all that and understand that and prepare that well before you submit your application to the GMC. And then your application is then likely to hopefully progress a bit quicker through the process and and your advisors should be able to hopefully accept the majority of your evidence submission. Um, but we'll also be looking for, is there any particular gaps or areas that we feel that we could suggest that you may wish to improve your submission on? So is there something missing from your evidence that 
our guidance suggests, for example. So, for example, um, the guidance might suggest that you you provide your annual appraisal, uh, your multi-source feedback, or your 360 from the last five years. Is there a gap in your appraisals that we've identified? Um, so we give you opportunity to 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 reflect on that and hopefully fulfil those gaps. And you have up to two months, uh, roughly, to to gather any additional evidence uh, that you want to in support of your application, and then we'll review that evidence as well. And you can communicate with your individual advisor at the GMC during that process. Um, also, when that's ticking along, uh, we'll be in contact with the referees that you've nominated and your verifiers, um, and we'll keep you up to date up to date throughout the process in terms of whether we'd have responses from those, etc. And then once, um, essentially, hopefully we then get to a point where you're content that you don't want to submit any more evidence, you're happy with your application, we've managed to accept all your ev evidence, and then we'll verify a proportion of, of your evidence with each of your, your verifiers. And once we've had successful responses from those, um, then we'll prepare your application for submission to the relevant college or faculty, which is the sort of generally the third stage of the application. Uh, so we've got like a contract essentially with each of the of the Royal Colleges and, and faculties um, in relation to those particular specialty curriculums. So for example, surgical applications, we, we get the, the specialist input of the JCST, physician medicine based applications will go to the, the Joint Royal College Physicians Training Board. Um, and uh, we have a, a legal deadline of three months. Um, uh, from the point that we submit it for their evaluation to give a decision on our application. Uh, so we we upload it to them. Uh, they instruct their assessors, uh, a minimum of two independent evaluators, to essentially review your application, the evidence you presented against the requirements in the curriculum. Um, and then a, an evaluation report, uh, really quite detailed, um, usually about 30 pages long on average, is, is returned to the GMC. Um, and that goes through all the areas of the application, essentially discusses whether you, you have or you haven't presented sufficient evidence to demonstrate the requirement across the breadth of the curriculum. And then the GMC have a process then as the decision maker to essentially review that evaluation. And then we will issue a decision on the basis of that Royal College's recommendation once we're satisfied um, to issue that decision that we're happy it's a robust um, decision and explains everything clearly. Sometimes we get asked for a success rate. So I have got some here um, and uh, they've been similar over the last few years. I mean, what I would say, and this is for all specialties is that, um, and there is another slide coming with some in terms of the more common specialties that we receive, um, but they're not an indication in terms of how likely you're going to be successful. Um, so please don't view them in that way. And so this says, for example, that in 2020, 57% um, of all the application decisions we issued on Caesars were successful and the others were unfortunately not successful for certain reasons. As that doesn't mean you have roughly a 60% chance of being successful. Um, that's just the statistics that we've issued. Um, and they are quite variable as you can see through this slide in terms of particular specialties. Um, ultimately, the, the quality of individual applications is, is very variable. We get some fantastically uh, prepared applications and we get some that unfortunately not, not as well prepared. Um, so for example, clinical radiology, the second one along there, just under 80% were successful. And then other specialties are obviously, you see some lower numbers there. Um, but again, uh, we appreciate that uh, this is quite an undertaking for anyone to go through this process. And this may, may have some influence on that. But what I would say is that you'd please don't see these in terms of that's my likelihood of being successful. The likelihood of you being successful is, is how well you prepare uh, your application. Uh, so there's no kind of quota or anything like that. Um, it's purely an individual assessment against the curriculum and your, your particular evidence. Um, some themes there, this isn't an exhaustive list, but maybe some common themes in terms of what we've seen over the years um, in terms of why applicants are maybe unsuccessful in particular areas of the curriculum. Um, and this is obviously generic to all specialties, but um, the first point there, um, this can be reasonably common. It, it's really important that you demonstrate your current competence in relation to um, the syllabus competencies of the curriculum. Um, so workplace-based assessments, the, 
the assessment kind of forms and, and the process that the trainees are, are generally using in the UK and alongside the curriculum. These are a, a really strong and not the only, but a real robust method in terms of demonstrating um, how well you do things and your current competence um, signed off by a range of other consultant colleagues that you perhaps work alongside with. Um, we appreciate for CESA applicants that um, quite often they, they may be um, completed training several years ago. Um, it's really important to show within predominantly the last five years that you current, your competencies are current and up to date. So workplace-based assessments can really be helpful to demonstrate that particularly if you haven't worked in an area of the curriculum or the specialty for a while, um, hold your application back a bit, delay your application, go and get some more case mix, some more opportunity to work in that particular field and get some workplace-based assessments done uh, with some colleagues that you work alongside, senior colleagues, essentially to, to confirm that you're currently competent in these areas. Um, and you may see uh, one of the key documents, and I'm sure it'll be touched on in terms of the advisor breakout groups, is, uh, is the SSG or the specialty specific guidance. And within there and within the curriculum, there's some quite, for most specialties, there's some quite specific guidance or requirements in terms of the type on volume of, of workplace based assessments that we would expect an applicant to present for CESA. Uh, standard test of knowledge. So this doesn't necessarily apply to every specialty, but Many specialties have um, a particular examination uh, or an exit exam or something that a trainee following the curriculum in the UK would be would need to achieve uh, alongside all the other evidence to fulfil their CCT. Um, so that is kind of the stand the I guess the requirement in terms of the standard of knowledge that you would need to demonstrate as part of your application. So it's not mandatory that you you have that qualification that's in the curriculum. You may consider that actually it would be helpful and easier for you to demonstrate that if you have the exam. Um, so that's certainly potentially an option for you uh, and something you need to think about quite carefully, but you may have other qualifications in the specialty that you consider alongside other evidence in their application that you can present to demonstrate your knowledge. Um, and then some other areas, uh, audit, um, and, and really you need to look at the individual requirements for your special curriculum here. Um, but it's quite common to expect some kind of um, recent engagement, particularly in the last five years, in, in some auditing projects, quality improvement projects, and to demonstrate your, your understanding and your engagement throughout the full stages of that auditing process. And that needs to be really clear through your evidence, what your role was, what your responsibility was. Um, you can't just provide the audit data. You need to provide the report or the presentation that, that demonstrates your engagement through, through that through that full process. Um, and then there's other areas like research. Um, specialising in one area can, can crop up from time to time. So um, you've got to remember that you're applying in the full specialty. So you need to demonstrate your current competence in the full specialty. So if you've narrowed your field to a, a sub area of the curriculum, then it may be that you're going to struggle to demonstrate your current competence across the breadth of the specialty. And you need to think about that quite seriously uh, before you apply. And perhaps you need to hold your application back until you've had some opportunity to top up and show you maintain competence in, in the full curriculum. Uh, just quickly then, the, the decision phase. So if you're successful, um, then you're entered onto the specialist register and you get a copy of your C certificate in the post and a copy of that evaluation report that the, the Royal College have provided and um, the GMC has endorsed as part of the decision. So you get to read through that and see all the comments about how you're, you fulfilled the curriculum through your application. If you're unfortunately unsuccessful, um, it's, uh, it's not the end of the road. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on the most common response route to that, which is the review application. Um, essentially, um, what's probably most helpful is you'll get the GMC will write to you and, and inform you of their decision and that you've been unsuccessful and what your options are in terms of responding to that. You get a copy of the evaluation report that the college again have, have, have uh, provided and we've, we've used as part of our decision. So you get to see all the commentary about uh, how you fulfilled certain aspects of the curriculum and then the bits that you haven't and the reason for that. Um, and the most common response is, is a review application. Um, and uh, so if you are, if you are, unfortunately unsuccessful first time round, then there is the option to apply for a review and you have up to 12 months from the date on your of the decision on your initial submission. 
Um, it's currently just over £700 to apply for a review. And the key thing with a review, I suppose, is that you're, you're only and you're solely assessed against the, um, the areas that we've determined that you did not fulfil or demonstrate to the curricular standard in your initial submission. So you don't have to kind of present all the application again. Uh, you just have to then focus on the areas that, that we've said no to. Um, but ultimately, what you should aim to do is is aim to get it first time round, and you certainly can get it first time round if you prepare your application thoroughly. And this, the success rates for review are, as you probably expect, considerably higher. Um, and that's probably because applicants then have a specific list or a couple of areas that they then need to focus on within that review period. And uh, just quickly, um, just conscious of of the time in here, but um, you may have heard of uh, changes to the curricula and some of the curricula has already been updated. Um, and the, the time frame we're working to now is, I suppose, the end of next year, which is that all of the specialty curricula have to be up updated um, to be more outcome based and focused on this GMC general professional capability framework. So many of this, some of the specialties I think that are present here today have already had their um, curricula updated and, and there's details about that on the GMC website. Um, but for most specialties, what we're doing is, is, is running a bit of a transitionary period. Um, so if I can just quickly explain that. Um, if say there's a current curriculum that's on the website, that's what you would be assessed against. And then a new curriculum comes out, say for example, um, uh, in January, uh, 2022, um, then usually this, the time frame we will give you will give you the opportunity to either apply against that the, the older version of the curriculum or this new curriculum for 2022 up to a certain time period. And, and on average, that's usually at least about 12 months. Um, but there'll be there's full details about that on the website as and when the, the curricula get approved. There's still quite a few to come through. Um, and many of the colleges put, are putting details in terms of curricular progress on their websites as well. Um, but for example, you may have an opportunity to apply against either of the curriculum, whichever is best for you and you you wish to up to a certain up to a certain point in time. Um, just some quick links there, and I'm quite happy for this presentation to be circulated if if that would be helpful. But um, we do have a, what we call a Caesar rotor um, Monday to Friday, uh, where you can phone up um, and ask pre-application queries about the process, or you can drop an email to to that email address there, and that will come directly through to our specialist applications team at the GMC. So if you've got any questions about uh, anything on our website, the application guidance, that type of thing, then we'd encourage you to get in touch and, and clarify things before you apply. Um, and we, we respond to emails just to say, uh, usually in five working days. So if you've not had a response to an email after a day or so, then we have got your email. We just, um, we're just working through it and we will get back to you. Um, and there's a, a specific area through the website there where all the guidance that we will talk about today is, is all available on that website. Um, so I'll, I'll finish there. I hope that's been helpful so far. Thank you, Peter. That was excellent. You know, thanks very much. And now I think we are going to go into a breakout rooms as they have been allocated. You can look into your chat bar, what rooms you're supposed to be. The people who are on the surgical side, please stay in this room. But I, I think Tom is leading on the surgical and dental and Josie will be leading in the medicine and psychiatric and Alicia in the accident emergency and anesthetic room. So surgical side, please stay on, but for the others, please try to move into your allocated rooms and then we can start the next process, please. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'm just going to open the rooms now. Uh, the instructions are in the chat. So you need to, um, when I say go, go down to the breakout rooms button at the bottom and you'll be able to select the room you want to move to from there. So I'm just opening them now. Okay, so you should see, if you go to the button at the bottom. Yep, so I can see we've got people moving through, that's working. Thanks everybody.
So we've got 47 still in the main room. Thirty-nine left in the main room. It looks like we've got a large number of people that have gone to the right rooms now. So in this main room, Tom, are you there for your presentation? Yes, I am indeed. Hello. Excellent. Hi to Thank everyone. You, I'm, I'm Tom. Yeah. yeah. So we just give him a minute or so, and then we can start your presentation with again. Perfect. So I've got 36 in this room now. There's 42, I think, if I'm correct, you know, assigned for this room. OK, it looks like there might be some people who weren't able to join in that case. Uh, okay, in that case, Tom, if you're happy, you know, we can start your presentation, please. Perfect. Um, yep, yeah, so as explained, I'm gonna see how this works. Brilliant. Is this, can you see that? <laughs> Not at the moment. Um, how do I share it with the group? <laughs> Sorry, I've, I haven't, done this before where do i share screen share you screen. go to the bottom of your screen there should be um a green share screen button yep perfect click on that done and then that's it yeah it's perfect out. so yeah, can everyone it. see that okay yeah yeah brilliant um right so as explained um i'm a specialist applications advisor um, and we're just going to run through sort of a lot of the um, kind of not specialty specific aspects of the application, kind of the admin side, really, um, that's all really important and that often kind of gets overlooked, maybe. Um, so the first thing is the CV. Um, and this is always um, a, bit, a bit of a, a recurrent issue, to be honest, um, because we at the GMC have a very, and with the Caesar, we have a very strict style of how the CV should be laid out, how it should be presented. Um, and it is really against the four domains of um, good medical practice, really. Um, so essentially, um, there's a big guide on our website, which is really clear on the structure that needs to be used. I'm gonna take you through that in a second. Um, but yes, um, and then finally, so, employment dates um, are actually really important. So when you set up your CESAR application, you'll be asked to provide your employment history back to when you attained your PMQ. Um, and it's really important that these are accurate because that's what's put in the system. And then when we review your CV, we, we can't accept the CV unless those dates match. And then it's kind of, it becomes a bit of a faff really, um, because you would then otherwise have to fill out these other forms. So just a, a big top tip, always make sure that you're accurate with those dates. So it's quite, quite straightforward really, um, starts with personal details, then your registrations, memberships, so that will be professional bodies um, mainly, and then qualifications. Um, so it is obviously a bit different to what you might expect from a more standard CV for just a, any normal job. Um, and then here we have employment history. So this is the really important one. Um, and as you can see, it's um, so all dates need to be the full date. No, so not just, you know, starting in this month. Um, so it's the yeah, day, day, month, month, and then the full year um, format. Um, and we like a little um, job description of um, your responsibilities there, but it doesn't need to be too lengthy because the um, employment evidence will cover that. And then um, in employment history two is gaps in employment. So yes, so we need to account for any gaps um, of over 28 days. Um, so I know that that, you know, 
in the time since PMQ that that does happen. So definitely um, just important to note. Um, again, so you've got awards, research experience, publications, presentations, CPD. So CPD would just be a list of all the um, all the you know courses that you've done in the last five years, um, conferences attended or uh, courses attended, um, audit teaching training management procedures and then any extras um, so this will all line up with the evidence that goes into the CESA application so it's important that everything is covered and everything that you kind of submit in the application is accounted for in the CV as it's all triangulated and the evaluators will all look at that um, so yes common mistakes as I've kind of um, pointed out an out-of-date CV is not good. Um, and then a standard CV rather than a GMC Caesar CV is a very different thing. Um, again, the structure doesn't match the employment letters, um, doesn't include the job description and doesn't match the application form. So as long as you kind of, it, it just, it, it saves a lot of energy down the line if just, the guidance is really, really strictly followed, and you know these points are um, taken into account. Then, um, then it's quite straightforward and makes life a lot easier. It's of course the first thing that the evaluators will see from an application. Um, so this was kind of covered before the structured reports. Uh, so this is when you nominate your referees. Uh, so we say we a minimum of, a, so at least four referees and a maximum of around six. Um, so their, their reports are actually, and their references are actually really important and they really are taken into account um, by the evaluators at the Royal College. Um, so, so these are an important aspect of the, of the application. And we also say as well that two should be um, colleagues who work in your specialty uh, specifically. Um, and yes, as it says, you know, it, it, these should be people that you've worked a lot with, that can comment on your skills and your experience um, and support your application as, 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 as best they can really. Um, and also we quite like a nice spread. So in the last five years, or actually um, this is surgical. So in the last six years, um, then it kind of should cover um, your places of work pr pretty well um, so that, there aren't any major gaps. And then of course, your primary referee should be your current medical or clinical director. So we often, this is often a, um, a question that comes to me is that, oh no, but my clinical director has no experience of me at all, um, which isn't the point. Um, they are there to be able to have that seniority to comment on your probity, um, which is which is a part of the structured report that's quite important. So even if they cannot comment on other aspects of your work, they still need to be nominated and it should be your current one and your current place of work. Um, and another point is when submitting um, referees, if they are GMC registered, um, need to provide their GMC reference number um, because that is how we communicate with all GMC registered doctors. So even if you, you know, and this also kind of ties into another common issue is, um, or miscommunication, is that we can't communicate with a doctor through any other, um, so a referee or a verifier with any other email address other than the one registered to their GMC profile. So even if in your application you've put their Gmail or whatever, or their something, um, we can only actually go through the one on their GMC account. Uh, so that's just something kind of to note. Anonymization. Um, so I know Pete kind of covered this a bit. Anonymization is really important um, that all um, evidence that comes to us uh, should be anonymized really. So all patient data um, and patients, relatives, anything that can identify a patient really. And then, um, then colleagues slash trainees that you have assessed. So you should only really be redacting colleague information um, in the capacity of, you know, appraising them. So uh, even if it's a reference that's very positive that you've written for them, that should be redacted. Um, and WBAs that you've, you know, um, 
you've done on on a trainee or a colleague all that data needs to be anonymized the only other time that a colleague's um data should be redacted is in the capacity of a complaint a, the context of a complaint um and that's kind of for obvious reasons so that's another kind of another regular thing that crops up is that for example in you know referral letters or meeting minutes the evaluators actually like to see the types of people that you're interacting with so their details their names do not need to be redacted in that case because it shows you know it shows them a, a better picture of your practice so um so that's always um useful um and I know Pete may have mentioned this, but we we at the GMC, we use Adobe Acrobat for our um, redactions, and we know for a fact that that works well, works for us. Um, so, so that's just an important thing to bear in mind. Um, for example, highlighting areas of black or gray, that doesn't count as redaction because we can still copy and paste all that patient data from underneath. Um, so that would then be deleted off our system and returned to you. Um, and, you know, the, the colleges will be able to see when we provide our, our reports on your evidence, our checklists, they will be able to see that that date, that those pieces of evidence have been deleted. Um, so in line with good medical practice, it's always good to just thoroughly, thoroughly check your evidence. Authentication. Um, so aside from verification, we have authentication, which is really just to do with registration and qualifications that were obtained outside of the UK. Um, so these require authentication, which is sort of um, essentially just a stamp by a solicitor or the awarding body, um, and then can um, attest to it being a certified copy. So that that's just really important only in terms with, you know, your SMQ, specialist and specialist registration if attained outside of the UK. Um, this also applies to um, to yeah to all specialist um, medical qualifications and the registration. Um, so that, and you can find that's quite straightforward and there's um, guidance on that at the bottom of our verification page. Um, and then verification. So alongside nominating your referees, you will also nominate your verifiers. So there should be one verifier from each hospital slash trust um, that um, you're submitting evidence from. So um, as you know, the, your evidence should really the bulk of it all be from the past six years. Um, we wouldn't expect you to nominate too many verifiers. So sometimes that could, can often um, raise a flag if someone has nominated 15, um, because it would be quite difficult to work in 15 places in, in six years, um, especially separate hospitals and trusts. Um, so that would need to be um, a consultant um, in that hospital, and they should be working at that hospital from when you begin your CSER application to when you submit your CSER application to the Royal College. So once it's gone through us, um, that's another common issue um, that arises. Um, and in order to verify your evidence, they'll need to complete a performer. Um, I think we may have yeah, a sample of a performer, um, so I can talk you through that a little bit actually. Um, and they will complete that, they'll sign that, and you'll submit that as part of your application. And then when we're going through the evidence, we go through the performer to ensure that everything that requires verification has been um, you know, clearly listed. So the performer is therefore quite an um, important document. Um, so it looks like this. Um, we used to, in the past, it was, a, um, it was the process of um, stamping and signing every single page of evidence. That's no longer the case. Uh, this is a lot more um, simplified, I'd say. Um, and you're expected, sorry, these are a bit blurry, but you're expected to list all types of evidence that fall under those categories um, in that manner. So um, I'm just going to go on to this one, actually. Um, so you would we would expect in the lectures if you were you know submitting five lectures from one hospital we'd expect to see times five lectures um written next to it there um so i keep touching my screen um with the rest of the columns filled out because that's also really important um 
so to to really make sure that it's clear that um they are they are the, the piece of evidence as they appear in the application so um so yes to include a, a you know a thorough description the type of document when that's um what year that is coming from and then the total number of pages and that should be accurate um otherwise it's difficult to be able to um confirm that it has been verified um also um the when listed on the performer the pieces of evidence should you know they should be listed as they appear in the online application so if you have um you know um when i said earlier about you know five lectures those five lectures if they're listed as one on the performer they should appear in the application as one file with that number of pages um and much the same with with other aspects such as audits and service improvement and government governance you know these um everything should line up um as as perfectly as possible in order to make sure that each file and each upload in the application has been correctly verified and then at the end um your verifier will sign their name there um currently as we're doing everything online it doesn't need to be um, a digital signature or anything we, we we just accept the name typed um and then you will submit that in the very final sequence of your application which is just the it's called the verification sequence um so yeah i've kind of covered these um but the do's and don'ts are here um really just to make sure it's as reflective as it can be of the evidence as it's presented online um, in the online application um, and yes certainly do not provide more than one uh, performer um, per hospital um, because um, that can obviously confuse matters um, i know some people think um, you know if 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 it's different departments or different areas um, no they can still if they're part of that hospital slash trust um, can verify evidence from that hospital slash trust. Um, documents that don't require verification. Um, so of course your CV, um, that goes without saying. 360 and multi-source feedback. Um, again, anything relating really to feedback except from formal teaching feedback um, does not require verification. Um, CPD and course certificates. Um, so really, any courses that you've done so, so with the ATLS um, that won't require verification um, and because of that it means that you can group all of them in the application into one CPD file um, because it doesn't upset the verification um, process. Um, similarly publications in the public domain um, if they've got the DOI and or, and slash or the link then, um, then it's absolutely fine the evaluators can see how um, verified that is because it's, it, as we say, in the public domain. Um, reflected diaries, as these are self-made, this is absolutely fine. Honours and prizes, same applies to the course certificates. And finally, testimonial letters. Um, so when, and to whom it concern, to whom it may concern letters, um, they're all absolutely fine. Um, and they therefore, much like CPD, can be grouped together um, into into one upload um just to save on the number of um individual files and uploads in your application translation um so um sort of as this is kind of goes without saying that all evidence that's not in english should be translated um so that it can be read clearly by um the evaluators at the royal college um and yes so this for validation slash authentication that the same applies just so that that is um, as clear as possible to us at the GMC and the Royal Colleges. Um, so now we're going to go on to, so you've already been shared pack A, um, but now we're going to move on to pack B, which is about different types of evidence and triangulation of evidence. Um, so for one second, I'm going to see how to stop sharing. <laughs> um, bear with me.
Right, can everyone see that okay? Yeah, we can see it. Cool, perfect. Um, one second, I've just lost my usual view. Okay, it's fine. Okay, so this is sort of a sample of evidence. Um, and this is actually quite, quite a useful um, document um, just to see the different types of um, evidence and how it kind of should look and how it how it looks to us. Um, so we're going to begin with examples of strong evidence. Uh, so this is all um, the strong primary evidence that um, that really forms should form the bulk of your portfolio for the CSER application. Um, especially for surgical specialties, this will end up being like your log books, um, WPAs, um, and um, things like that. So I'll just scroll down. So this obviously is an example of a log book. Um, so I know um, most surgical specialties will have access to the e-log book format, and that works absolutely fine. Um, but so one common um, issue that arises is that for all surgical specialties, we ask that you submit a full standard logbook. And a full standard logbook will look like this, obviously in the logbook format, but it will be in the sense that each procedure has been listed clearly on, an, on, a, on each line. Um, so it's a full table of all procedures that, have, that you've been involved with in the past six years. Um, so a lot of, uh, there, there's a lot of uh, back and forth um, in, this, in this regard actually, um, because it, it, it's often unclear how to export that from the e-logbook platform, um, but it is definitely possible. Um, and yes, so, and it needs to be this full standard logbook. So you see we've got here, we've got the age, the gender setting, um, the procedure itself, um, and any sort of documentation relating to it. Um, so like this, as you can see, it's all sort of um, anonymized for patient data anyway. Initials are fine um, in terms of rejection, but sometimes best to avoid them just in case that evidence can be triangulated with other evidence and that patient can therefore be identified. Um, but yes, so as a part of the surgical um, application, we would expect to see the full logbook, which would probably end up being about three, 400 pages. Um, we would then expect to see the operation group report um, and the SAC indicative report. So those are the three most important um, logbooks, um, logbook evidence that we will see. Um, and so the evaluators will be able to look at your, um, your basically your, your numbers on the operation group report and then see how they triangulate and correlate to the full full logbook that would look like this. Similarly, if, if you don't use the logbook platform, which some people don't, um, and keep a sort of a manual Excel spreadsheet, um, we will accept those as well, um, as long as they have all the relevant information like this. Um, and also just to note with those logbooks, they will all need to cover the same period of time. So it needs to be the last six years. Um, and as I say, the same time period so that it can all be um, triangulated and that the evaluators can really assess all those numbers um, and those procedures um, as one. Um, this is an example of a um, medical report, I think, or a referral letter. Um, so you can see how everything has been redacted very well. Um, in this instance, it's been overly redacted. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you don't need to redact the name of the um, doctor that you're approaching. Um, but obviously this is, comes from an actual application. Um, so we've had to anonymize it um, even more thoroughly. Um, but you see, you know, the NHS number, address, all of that is, goes without saying is very much um, patient identifiable and must be redacted in this style. Um, just hang on there. Much the same here. Um, here a case case based discussion. So obviously, with um, surgical specialties, these are going to be very important, and all WBA is going to be very important. Um, here we've redacted the doctor's and assessor's name, but 
No, um, that's another a common thing. Assessors' names um, in WBAs are really important. Um, as I'm sure I, I, you're aware, um, there are certain requirements for certain surgical specialties that you have each WBA um, undertaken by uh, two different assessors. So we need to see the assessor's details there in order to ensure that that uh, requirement has been met. Um, same sort of idea. Um, this is sort of like a reflective practice. These are always important um, throughout throughout the application. They can sort of be dotted around or um, or put in with audits, I think is the best place for them to go. Um, and then finally, triangulating evidence. Um, so it says here, it's, you know, using a variety of independent sources to demonstrate um, evidence of your competence across the depth and breadth of the CCT curriculum. Um, and then around, and how they like correlate to a learning outcome. So in this um, pack, we've taken the example of teaching um, which is um, a part of any CSR application, um, of course, including surgical ones. Um, so we've got here, we'd expect to find teaching timetables, correspondence, um, presentation slides of lectures, a feedback summary for the teaching session, or maybe even an assessment of teaching, um, and examples of individual feedback forms. Um, so that, as, as we said, is an, is an example of strong triangulated evidence. And then this would then be confirmed, um, triangulated further by appraisals, um, which everyone is expected to submit, testimonial letter, letters, and of course, the structured reports from your referees. Um, so here, a quick example of quite a rough teaching timetable, um, which just at least confirms um, teaching days. Um, this obviously more of a formalized um, teaching timetable, um, but it, yeah, it's a good way of, pri um, of primary evidence to show your engagement and your regular engagement with teaching. Um, this is a lecture, obviously. Um, so this is important if ever you're using pictures of patients in a lecture um, to make sure that those are um, redacted appropriately. Um, also, it's really important with lectures that you date them um, so the evaluators are aware of when they took place in the last six years and to make sure that they are, you know, recent evidence. Um, so usually this can be done on the first slide. Um, or sometimes I ask that doctors, you know, merge all the presentations together um, and create an index page just to make sure that it's really clear. Um, and as you can see here, um, instead of uploading the PowerPoint presentation in PowerPoint format, this doctor has chosen to um, export it as a PDF and um, have four slides per page, which just keeps the number of pages down, um, which is always important when the application is so very long. Um, so yes, so obviously these are quite self-explanatory. And then formal teaching feedback. Uh, this requires uh, verification, as I said earlier, um, and is listed on the performer. Um, and then here you can see how the appraisal sort of mentions these areas so that they can be they are the yeah. triangulated features. So uh, um, this is a, a good example of a to whom it can make concern letter. Here, obviously, we wouldn't want you to redact the name of the person writing the, the testimonial. And um, we've obviously just done that for privacy reasons. Um, as it, you know, it's good to see where they came from. And then this is an example of a structured report. Um, so this, these are the sort of questions that um, the referee will be asked. Um, and here you can see this has been highlighted about areas of, um, that then apply to the teaching evidence um, and how this all kind of links in together. Um, you can actually find a um, template of the blank structured report um, on our website, just in case you just wanted to see the kind of things that are being asked of the referees in your selection of them. Um, but yeah, so that's the end of pack B and actually the end of our presentation. Um, so 
um, I believe now is um, a time for questions. Yes, thank you, Tom. That's excellent. So I've got a couple of questions that were put to us on the chat bar before we start. Okay. So are you happy to take those questions? I am in. I am indeed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the questions was asked: Can I achieve my specialist qualification knowledge example full FRCA? after achiever high learning outcomes or a similar pathway where I can progress to big outcomes after I pass my final FRCA? Um, and this was a question from Sumit Kumar. Okay, um, that, that, that is a good question actually. Um, so, sorry, can we just, can I hear that one again? Uh, that kind of yeah. um, slumped okay. me a little bit. <laughs> can I achieve my specialist qualification knowledge for example full frca after achieving higher learning outcomes or a similar pathway where i can progress to big outcomes after i pass my final frca um i'm not actually too sure on that one um frankly um to be to be perfectly honest perhaps um, what we could do is tom if there's mm. a you perhaps the gmc could answer it back to us and then we can feed it back to the yes yeah that, that sounds good I'll, I'll make a note for that one um yes. i would I, I personally would say that i i i think you can um but that depends on um the college running the um specialist medical qualification okay um, that's fine you know i yeah. think there's no rush we can answer that back after yeah mm -hmm. another question that has come up on the chat bar is can i confirm that a surgical logbook can be submitted as an Excel document and not the surgical e-logbook format. This is a question from Geeta Maraj. Yes, so it can. I, I did um, slightly touch on that earlier. It can certainly, as long as it has um, all the, the details that we, um, that we require, um, so that were included in that pack B, um, right. as long as it's in that format, that's absolutely fine. Um, what I would say, however, is that um, although we do accept Excel documents um, uploaded into the application, it's a lot better to um, for an applicant to convert it into a PDF um, so that they then have control of how it how it appears um, in the application and how it appears to the evaluators. Um, I know some of these uh, logbooks can have, you know, 12 sheets and, you know, span columns and columns and columns. So when it's uh, presented nicely, um, and presented in PDF, then yeah. that that's just more ideal. But okay. yes, we do we do accept them not in the right. um, e log book format. Another question coming up is: Is the old style FRCS acceptable for season? Um, you'd have to consult the exact guidance for that. Um, I think it is. Um, really, in terms of eligibility for Caesar, um. It, what is required is the um, a specialist medical qualification in the specialty and slash all the special med specialist medical training um, of at least six months. Um, so in terms of eligibility, that's fine. Um, it's just for specific specialties. Um, you'll have to look into the, um, the specialty specific guidance um, to double check about meeting the test of knowledge. Um, okay. But that's obviously separate to the eligibility. Right. And if you don't have the qualification that is the you know the current test of knowledge um, then there is the option of um, providing alternative evidence and then mapping that portfolio against the curriculum but that changes per specialty and um, is all kind of detailed very well in in the SSGs. Okay that's fine thank you and another question we got to, I think another minute or so before we move on to the next one do the surgical log books also need to be verified question from Nidhi Goswami they do indeed. Um, yeah. So yeah, Thank all you. of them. Yeah. Next question is older evidence than six years shouldn't be included or should be included? Shouldn't. Um, so you can, um, there are some aspects where, you know, for example, with log books, um, if you really, if you would like to include evidence over six years, um, we, we, we can accept that, um, but as the evaluators are assessing current competencies um, for surgical specialties, it is six years. 
Um, so, you know, really the ev the bulk of evidence should be from that period. And if you were to submit, um, for example, um, wanted to submit logbook evidence from over six years ago, that would have to be a separate upload to the six year logbook, sure. um, just so that it's clearly um, distinguished. Um, but yes, I would I would say that. Um, okay. And yeah, just to keep the evidence as recent as sure. possible. A question coming from Kirsty Davis. What were the three logbooks Tom was referring to? So the full standard logbook, so that has every procedure from the last six years um, listed, the operation group report, and the SAC indicative report. Right. Okay, excellent. I think we leave the questions at present as such, because we get more time at the end. So now mm -hmm. I think we are going to move on and to the next breakout session is how to present and submit evidence in GMC online. So are you- Yes. Um, perfect. If you just bear with me, yeah, sure. I will be able to get rid of that. Um, so we have created, um, so this is all online. Um, and it's the sort of online application guide. Um, and it's a step-by-step -step, um, click through area um, that shows you how you can apply for your Caesar and then what it will look like when you're arranging evidence. Yeah. So I'll just walk you through it, I think. Yeah, just Tom, for people who mm -hmm. questions I have not been able to take up, don't worry, we have got some time at the end of it where I will try and take as many questions as possible and some which we are not able to take I can assure you they'll be answered so just bear with us so carry on Tom please. Perfect so for here you would click on my registration um, my applications and quite oh, sorry <laughs> um, and quite simply apply um, here so this is starting a whole new application continue the application no, no, yes. Have you got a European special quality? No, being found eligible for no, nope. That one often sometimes confuses people. Um, <laughs> um, so the answer is no. Um, if you if you don't already hold specialist registration, um, and then scroll down, then you'll have you know the um, standard guidance on eligibility and applications you can make if you have introduced specialty and then that's where you apply for a CESA so then simply you'll select your um, your specialty or if you're applying to non-CCT you would just write it out here um, important to note um, and it does happen um that some that um double check whether your uh, specialty is cct or non-cct i've seen people apply for cct specialties here and then it completely generates the application in completely the wrong format um and especially for surgical ones at the moment where they're changing their formats um it's really important to make sure that you select that correctly um just so that it doesn't generate the application in in, in the wrong format um, so then quite straightforward here, you would add your qualification um, and give all the you know, necessary information. Um, you would then add in your professional experience. This is what I spoke about earlier with the CV. So it's really important that that is accurate, that you are you doing using the correct dates and also that this all dates back to your PMQ. Um, so this can also, I, I know a lot of people can get quite stuck on this, um, in this particular section of the application, because if um, the dates don't quite make sense, or there are any gaps of over 28 days and they haven't been accounted for, or you know, some people just ignore their experience abroad, so you won't be able to progress until that comprehensive picture of your professional experience has been um, clearly and accurately um, recorded here. Then adding your referees. Um, so this is, as I said, really important. GMC reference number. If they are GMC registered, 
make sure that you put that in for each individual. Otherwise, we'll just ask you um, <laughs> for that when, when it gets assigned to an advisor. Um, very much there. Um, and you would move through the application in this way. Registration and licensing history, history that obviously goes without saying. And then evidence summary. So this is, you know, probably the most important part. Um, so this is actually done out for a radiology application. Um, and they they have their, um, their applications are separated into capabilities and practice. So it's slightly different, but um, the, the same principles are in the same. So as said before, um, you know, one second, sorry. So this will show you what, what should be in here. Primary medical qualifications, specialist medical qualification, recent specialist training. So this is slightly different to how um, your applications may look, um, but just so you can get an idea, it will tell you what is there and what there is also recommended that you provide. Um, so it's it's kind of got the, the, the same information that is present in the SSG. Um, so, but it's it's quite useful as you can see that there. And then you would just add slash remove documents quite simply um, in that way. Um, and then add a description. It's, um, it's important to not overlook um, descriptions. So if you're, you know, especially in some sections um, when you're uploading quite a lot of things, um, it's useful to really use that description to distinguish between things. I would also say as well, um, when naming your file, it's really important that your file names are really descriptive of what they are. And that does, it does sound a bit like, um, a bit silly to say, but it, it's something that's, it, that often happens. Um, and as well, you should really be including the hospital slash trust in the file name or an anagram for it. Um, just so it's really clear where each piece of evidence is coming from. Um, so then it would look like this and that's been uploaded. So then you can edit, just gonna scroll down. And here you'll be asked to summarize the evidence you've provided. This can be in, in the form of a bullet point or sometimes you can get quite, um, um, quite detailed descriptions of everything. Um, for, for example, if in an area you weren't providing a type of evidence it was asking, you may, you know, justify that in that column, in that section. And here the, um, the status of each, um, each, we call them sequences, the status of each um, sequence in the application, it's really important that that is um, changed or updated where necessary to indicate the changes that have been made. Um, so at later stages, if we're asking you to submit evidence and you don't submit anything there, you need to change it to not submitting evidence before you can submit it. Um, otherwise it will just create an error. Um, and so it needs to reflect the changes that are being made to each sequence. Um, so then you would save that and then you would have this evidence. So this is, is your application. And then the, sorry, this is, it keeps, um, print and that would give you like this the sort of different aspects of your application and then oh sorry and then allow you to you know see everything in one place um just let me look at this here so this is this is good as well this will show you your different areas to make sure that they've been completed um and then as you go move through each sequence, uploading the evidence that it tells you, you would then hit the tick box and submit next. This is when you add your verifier. So much the same as when you add your referees, GMC reference number, please save that, tick the declaration box, and then you make the payment, um, which is obviously um, very standard. Um, and then you make the payment before the application is submitted. Um, and, but then that's all sorted and then it is finished. 
and then that's the end of the guide it, your application would then be submitted to us um and then of course so i'm going to stop sharing now actually um and then we're currently experiencing some delays at the moment um with assigning applications um to an advisor on the team from submission um but it's it's looking at about three or four months currently But yeah, um, if, do we have any further? Well, we do have further questions. Yes, we have. So, Tom, have you finished the last bit now? Yes. Your presentation. How, good. Yes, excellent. That's, that's when you base, certainly caught up a lot of time. So, a few questions mm -hmm. that have come up, and I'll ask you in order. So, just bear with me. Mm -hmm. And I'll do my best to answer them. Yeah, no, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Certainly. So one of the questions that came up was, and I read this to you. Mm -hmm. And this was a question to GMC facilitated. What are the GMC endorsements for do to do a Caesar in neuropsychiatry? My Caesar support consultant has advised me in general psychiatry. The ILO in general psychiatry has server neuropsychiatry. I'm really looking forward to the explanation. I'm not very really clear about this. If you understand the question. Um, I'm afraid I don't actually. I'm, um, yeah, yes, I'll read it again, see if you try, because I personally myself can't understand this. What are the GMC endorsements for a doctor to do a seizure in neuropsychiatry? My seizure support consultant has advised in general psychiatry. The ILO in general psychiatry has served as neuropsychiatrist. I'm really looking forward to this explanation. I'm not very clear about the question, but if you can answer it, or if you have got a clue what they're asking. Um, I'm not too sure at all. Um, no. Really, um, I, I'm inclined to say that general psychiatry um, kind of covers all of that. Um, right. And as a specialty, as a CCT specialty, um, perhaps neuropsychiatry. Um, I'm not really sure, I'm afraid. No. And I think we, we should kind of, because it's where this isn't a specialty specific um, event to kind of keep it more sure. uh, or less um, to do with specific specialty questions. Right. In, there's another question that has come up there, and this is from Usman Aba. If I have maintained an up-to-date registration with my home country, but not worked here for more than 10 years, do you still need this information? Um, yeah, uh, no. No, I because it's so. last only five current. years, I would have thought. Yeah. yeah, so it's last six years um, for surgical ones, um, five years for all others. Um, sure. And we don't need you know, evidence Before of that, yeah. old registrations. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, another question from Poonima Dalal. Part-time SAS doctors, how long submission can be submitted? Um, so that would be the same um, as as all the other evidence, really. Um, it's the last six, five yes. years, I would have thought. Yeah, yeah five, six years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't understand this question. Number of years for fifty percent working SAS. So I think I think that just refers to um, if 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 one is only working um, sort of fifty percent and working part time. Um, you know, can the, can it be extended? Um, the answer is uh, not really. Um, it needs to be the five, but last five and six years, and then, you know, hopefully in in that time you've been able to, the, you know, have have been able to acquire and accumulate evidence across the breadth and depth of the CCT curriculum, and um, you know that can be done in you know more or less time than than the five six years. Sure. A question here, I think, you know, this answer should be simple. The e-log book has patient hospital number. Does this all need to be detected? Yes. Sir. Certainly. Okay. 
Oh, I've seen one that was um, asked to me privately, yeah. um, uh-huh. but I can just answer it generally anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if, if, for example, you worked in a hospital 10 years ago and um, you no longer maintain a relationship with that hospital, et cetera, et cetera, for whatever reason, you don't need to submit evidence of employment evidence from that hospital anyway. It just needs to be, as I say, five, six years um, of employment history. Um, the the listing on your CV will be enough to confirm that to us. Yeah. And I think there's a statement here more than a question. The pandemic has affected elective surgical lists, making it difficult. Show, oh, current competencies, does this impact the imp- application? Um, it's obviously taken into account by the colleges um, and by us that COVID has, of course, um, had a pretty detrimental effect on basically every aspect of life. Um, so, yes, it, it is taken into account, but, um, you know, the, the, the minimum indicative numbers are still there. We still, um, you know, the, the college, the, so with... Um, with search clubs, it's it's quite useful to look at the um, the JCST um, certification guidelines um, to see what's expected of a um, a CCT trainee um, and trying to best you know um, demonstrate equivalence to that. Um, but I but I will say um, it's best to try um, to meet those as much as possible. Um, and you know this slight lull for 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 a lot of people is considered, um, but just to, to really just try and meet those as much as possible. Yeah, there's a question here from Amina Nader asking: Does ISCP, that's the Intersurgical College this thing, program, count in the documentation? Um. So, no. Yeah, yeah, that that should be submitted. Um, and it, but it doesn't matter if that was over six years ago. Um, no, no, still, not six years ago, oh. because people log on to their, this thing, their work experience, their assessment on ISCP. That's the oh. oh, yeah. Does that count as documentation? I would have thought yes. Yes, if it's if it needs to be extracted from there um, and uploaded into the application. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I forgot for a second what that was. <laughs> I think that's about all the questions, unless I miss someone and people can put them on the chat bar if I missed any questions. Um, so I saw there's an, a question, another There's another question one. coming from Unima Dalal. I've heard about mentorship being successful in urology. Can it be introduced in OBS and gynae? Please, as I face struggle in getting any assessment for any reason, struggle exists for evidence to show for appraisals currently. If I request for seizure, I'm not very hopeful of the lack of support. I don't think so. We can answer that question, really. Unfortunately, not. That's um, that would have to be to do with um, the college who do the mentorships yes, or the deaneries. The team, really. Um, and unfortunately, we have nothing to do with that. So I think um, that's about all the questions we got here, really. I've just seen two more private ones um, yeah, that again well, can answer yeah. them. So if you've got a master's or any other qualification outside of the six, the five, six years, absolutely fine to submit that. Um, similarly, research from over six years ago, they, I would say um, to that, you know, it should, the bulk of it and the stuff that is relied upon should be from the last six years. But I, I personally would, uh, because especially with, you know, uh, people have written these amazing papers from 12 years ago, definitely still submit them. Um, but it's um, obviously just to bear in mind that the, the emphasis is on the last five, six years. Um, and then, no, so, um, sorry, about submitting evidence um, of employment. So when I say evidence of employment, I mean in that section of the application, and that's the employment contracts, the job descriptions, and the job plans. We only need to see that for the last five, six years. Your CV and the information in your application should, um, in your initial application, what we saw there, um, needs to date back to your PMQ. Yeah. Um, but we don't need the supporting documentation with with those, with the later ones. Um, and I think that may be it that I can see. Is it? So, uh, Tom, there was, what I asked, want to ask Fiona is, have the other breakout rooms finished? Because we've taken all the questions and answered them there. Because there is supposed to be a question and answer session from 1225 with Peter Clegg. 
Ah, okay. Um, I need to find I, out from Fiona whether the yes. other breakout rooms are finished. Okay. okay yeah. I can pop in and see if they're still going. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, give me a couple of minutes and I'll be right back. Mm -hmm. I think you might have answered all the questions, Tom, taken every question. Finish the last session. Oh, I just saw one saying, what is the best software for redaction? Um, we use Adobe Acrobat. What's that, sorry? Um, the best, well, we can't really say what the best software for redaction is, but we at the GMC use Adobe Acrobat. Oh, no, and I think we're actually gonna publish some updated guidance on redaction it's being worked on at the moment. Um, so we'll be able to share that with everyone. Um, when that's finalized. Right, okay. There's a question that has come up. Hi, I have CABM 2004, which equals to fellowship in medicine. Is that working? What Are you aware of that? Um, I have not heard of that, I'm afraid. Um, I don't know what CABM is. If somebody is online, can they please tell us what CABM is? is so that we can put this. So while the other two rooms are still delivering their presentations at the moment. Okay, that's fine. This is from Arab League Specularity or something. This is- Okay, well, as, as a specialist medical qualification, yeah, that, that sounds fine to me, um, right. yeah. And there's another question that's come up from Usman Abba. I have been in the same hospital contract in the last six years and have rotated with different consultants and subspecialty every six months. How do I enter in the CV section? Um, so you would, so you would, when, when, if it's the same hospital for the past six months, then you would just write that as the, um, as the predominant dates. And then beneath, you could explain the different rotations that you took throughout that. Um, and then in the work experience section, when you would make the application, you could then, um, you would just do the overall, the overall time that you were in that, um, in working for that hospital slash trust. Okay. Right. I think that answers. another question coming up if i do not have mrcs should i pursue say cers should be caesar yes this is a question from quang lee if if you don't have the mrcs yeah i think it's um, very difficult <laughs> <laughs> um that's kind of um not up for us to decide um sort of thing um the frcs you know um and the mrcs Yes, is is the test of knowledge, and it is it, it is um, more difficult um, to succeed without it. Um, I think. I'm not sure if I'm even allowed to say that. <laughs> okay. And I think that is about it, really. So I think we just for another five because other two rooms are still running. Mm -hmm. Tom, you were super efficient. So other two rooms are <laughs> as soon as they come in then we can have five, 10 minutes of any questions that are pending. Mm -hmm. So stay on there, I'd be grateful. Cool.
Another question has come up, Tom, for you. If I've done two years LAT in the specialty in M applying for, but outside the six years, will it still be relevant? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so in terms of eligibility, um, that doesn't really have a, a um, time frame um, or a limit. Uh, and LAT is, LAT, LAT is good for eligibility. Okay. I think some of the other rooms are still going on, so they will be joining us at 12.25. Okay, um, I may quickly have a quick five minute break there. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, yeah, but I'll be yeah, back absolutely. at 25. Okay, perfect. That's excellent. Excellent.
Yes, I'm going to start bringing people back in now. Yeah, OK. So I think everybody's in, I can see 73, 74 participants. Am I correct? Yes, that's right. Okay, so I think we have taken most of the questions that were on chat bar, but if still somebody feels they have got questions, we've got about 10, 15 minutes. So if anybody wants to put any questions on the chat bar, we've got Peter, Hay and Tom, we'll take any questions you want really to be answered. So feel free to write in the chat bar, please. Don't raise your hand, just put your question in the chat bar, please. There's a question that has come in. I'm curious if we can validate experience over five years by doing a refresher day or week? This is a question, could that be answered please? So I, I, I don't understand the full context of the question. So if perhaps if the person that asked it wants to just elaborate on that. Do you want to elaborate on it, Hema? I think what she's probably meaning is that her experience before the five years and is there anything she's, I think it's basically not something we can answer, that can there be a refresher day or a week that she can do that this could oh, okay. be taken? So I, it, it would depend on, I suppose, the individual competencies or experience that you, the applicant would want to show that they were maintaining in the last five years. Sure. Um, so I wouldn't want to say you could do a certain thing in a day, you could do a certain thing in a week. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, um, and the, there's quite often in some of the guidance that there, there is some some uh, details on this. But for example, um, if there is a particular area of of the curriculum, then it it may be that you need to do about three three to six months in that, um, and dependent on I suppose what your day to day role was and, and whether you were getting the access you required to the type of of patients or or conditions that you needed to to have have your competence for would would ultimately it's quite an individual situation, I think. Sure. Um, yeah. So um, the key thing is that you're, you're demonstrating that those competencies are current and maintained. And, and I, I think in most cases, uh, if you haven't worked in a particular area of the specialty for quite some time, um, then it may be you need three months or so. Um, preferably you do that in one sort of attachment where right. you could generally principally focus on that. Um, but, but certainly you could, bunch certain time together you just need to be really clear in terms of your you're showing the assessors um this is what i've done to demonstrate these particular areas of the curricular syllabus are, are up to date sure. yeah okay thank you next question for hematology 
do I need to do an MRC PET? So it, it, that it's uh, that is the uh, I suppose that is the the examination that's the qualification that that would be required by the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So so what we would say is is firstly consider whether you you have another qualification at hopefully a recent qualification that you consider is comparable with that sure um if you don't then generally you're putting yourself in a stronger position to to meet the standard of the curriculum if you do the examination in the curriculum so it's certainly yes. it's certainly a benefit yes sure thank you if an arcp outcome is over five years old would you advise submitting it questions from imran usmani uh, so what what we'd say is 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 generally any evidence predominantly should be within the last five years. Um, we have actually, um, and it's probably worth anybody's. Um, it's probably a benefit for anybody actually considering applying to have a read. We've we've recently published a a, a recency or a currency of evidence pro policy or guidance for Caesar applications, and it, it's on the GMC's website. Um, it's on the same pages as the specialty specific guidances for all the specialties. So if you if if you Google GMC SSG, it will take you to that landing page. And then there's some some guidance about timeframes and guidance around currency of evidence and, and when it may may or may not be appropriate to include older evidence. Mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, if if evidence is sort of more than six, seven, eight years ago, then it, it's going to have very limited consideration in your application. Yeah, thank you. A question from Dr. Beatrice. Can we present evidence from our e-portfolio, for example, teaching feedback from consultants? I would have thought yes. Yeah, certainly. Um, ultimately, you can choose to supply the evidence from whatever form you want to. Um, the key thing is that you consider the relevance of it to, to demonstrate in the CESAR application requirements. So we see many applicants use e-portfolio systems. Um, I think they can be really beneficial in terms of structuring and organizing your evidence. Many of them are kind of focused on the curricular, the curricular requirements. The key okay. thing is you need to download it from that system and, uh, and, and put it in your GMC CESAR application in, 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 and present it in the way that the CESAR application is structured. Um, we, we or the evaluators won't have any for example, access to any of your e-portfolio, um, we, we need you to put that in your application. Yeah, thank you. There's a question here. How can we get a copy of presentations of today, please? Yes, I think we'll share all the presentations, you know, and I think most of the, all the speakers were happy with that. So that shouldn't be an issue. Question from Asit Kumar. I'm moving from one subspeciality to a different within the same trust. Do I need different performer and does documents need to be verified by two different assessors? So if it's within the same trust and the same verifier has oversight of, of that documentation and is able to confirm it, then that would be reasonable to, to use the same verifier. The key thing is um, it's for you, I suppose, to, to show the GMC if you're, if you're going to do it in that way. Uh, explain why you've nominated that particular verifier to to um, to verify evidence, for example, from two separate hospitals within the same trust. The key thing is that to be a verifier, the individual needs to be somebody in um, a medical supervisory capacity to you who is able to confirm the the authenticity of that evidence. And if the GMC has any questions about it, they're able to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. um, so it it may be that that they're happy to do that, or it may be you need to nominate separate verifiers. Sure. And there's a question from Nikki. I have been a trainee up to ST3 within EM, I presume that's emergency medicine, and then stepped out of training. Do I need new evidence of workplace-based assessment at the lower level, or is just HST evidence okay? You need to show both. So you have to show the, in, the entire curriculum. So that's both the the core curriculum the and all the associated uh, specialties in that like intensive care anesthesia etc mm -hmm. and then your higher competencies right 
question again. I'm on a GP register. Do I need to be transferred to dermatology register to apply for dermatology season? Question from Gitanjali. No, so it, it, it's quite, it's fine to, um, to, to be on the GP register and then also apply for a Caesar in dermatology. Um, we, we wouldn't take you off the GP register if that, if that was the question. Um, you, would, you would retain that status. Uh, so you'd, you'd still be eligible to, to, to practice as a GP. And, but certainly, as long as you meet the eligibility criteria for dermatology, you could apply for specialist registration in that alongside it. Mm -hmm. And a question coming from anesthetics. Basic anesthetics ITU competencies achieved in 2008 in an 18-month job. Been practicing now in emergency medicines and using ITU and anesthetic skills daily. Will these competencies hold validity? They're well over five years, in 2008. So I, I would say the, the evidence from 2008 it's it's too old, unfortunately. It's it's quite a long time ago. Um, it's quite outside of the five year window, isn't it? So yeah. So really, you need to focus on on uh, gathering evidence of, as you say, the competencies in in relation to those specialties in in your day to day work. Uh, so so some case mix, uh, logbook data, etc., and some workplace based assessments in a range of those um, areas would. Would be would be strong evidence essentially to show that they're current and up to date. Okay, a question from Bridie Griffiths. I realize that this is a GMC talk, but I wonder if Peter could please point me in the right direction. Work in OMFS as an SAS doctor. I, this is talking oral facial maxillary and SAS doctor, but I'm singly qualified in dentistry. I now understand that. OMFS mentioned here would be a dual qualification. Is there a similar support guidance network for GDC that you know, or is this, or is there no crossover? There isn't a, a crossover. Um, ultimately, um, you uh, as the doctor would need to to approach the, the general dental council for any queries in relation to mm. to dental registration requirements. Right. And I think those are the main questions. There's one question come up here now, the last one. If you have completed the core training scheme in psychiatry, do you still need evidence along with the higher training curriculum? So, so um, you would need to, uh, you need to demonstrate, yes, the full curriculum uh through through your application evidence so that would uh for psychiatry it's generally a six-year training program uh three years of of course psychiatry training followed by three years of the the highest psych uh, specific training um there is something in the guidance that if if an applicant has the membership examination of of the royal college of psychiatrists then we take that as a satisfactory evidence of of the court of the the core psychiatry competencies, um, but otherwise it, it would be it will be the full yes the full curriculum. Okay, thank you. Final question, which I'm going to take. Some of these questions will be answered later. So the final question is from Jennifer Hurst. I'm an emergency doctor who finished ACCS four years ago. I've spent the last two years working abroad in a very low resource settings for medical. What's happened there? Lost the question. Low resource setting for medical NGO medicines sans frontiers. Because of the nature of the work, I don't have assessment of much evidence for this time. I want to finish my EM training via Caesar, but also continue to take regular time out to work abroad for this NGO. Will the very different nature of my work abroad, my low work abroad in my role, CV has causes a problem. So, so um, I, I think there's a challenge there, certainly. Um, it, ultimately, it kind of comes back to, you need to demonstrate um, current competence in relation to the, the EM curriculum. 
so you need to present evidence uh, predominantly from the last five years that demonstrates your competencies are current and up to date. So if you if you've been working, um, I suppose recently in a in a post where it's either maybe not specific to the specialty or or you're not gathering the type of evidence that's required for the process, then then yes, I think that's fair to say that 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 could be an issue for you. Um, it may be that you want to um, to delay your application until you're able to to acquire the type of evidence such as assessments, et cetera, that's required for the process. Okay, th thanks very much. I don't think so we can take any more questions, but I've got a couple of announcements to make. There is going to be a link on the chat bar for evaluation. So if you can all fill this up for, with the feedback and please forward it to us so that we can send you your CPD certificate. The link is on the chat bar. You can read it. And before I close, I would like to thank all the delegates for attending this and all the facilitators, especially from GMC, Peter, Tom, Josie, Alicia, for really helping us out with this. It's been an excellent. And without you, we couldn't have done this really. And also thank you, Carolyn and Caris, for helping us in organization of this seminar and the IT support we reached from Fiona. It can never be the face-to-face -face meetings can never be the same as online, but I think we did our best and I think it has been pretty good. So thank you everybody. And I will close this meeting now, but please fill in your evaluation chart and thank you to GMC and all your facilitators for helping us. All the best and round of applause from you, from everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for facilitating this and it's always enjoyable to be involved. So. Yeah. Thanks. Best of luck Thank with, you very much. with your applications. Thank you very much. Everyone. So I'll close the meeting now and thanks everybody. Bye bye. Bye now. Bye bye. Bye.